You ready? I am ready. Are you ready? I'm ready. I look at you and I'm not sure if it's you. It it's feels not. like it's a new ho co-host. I feel the same way when I look at myself. Yeah, Fantastic. Funny you say that. That's good. Mm. We're going to get back there. <laughs> hey, we're live. Alt Base Show brought to you by AltBase.nz. We're live three times per week, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. And these beautiful shows happen here in the Alt Base Studios in Fitsianga. So if you want to rent this space, if you want to do your own podcast, if you want to run some live meetings, whatever you want to do, this space is available for you. Yeah, get in touch. Altbase.nz. Uh, we've been doing this for, <sighs> I think, 15 weeks now, I'm pretty sure. Uh, show 48, that's pretty special. Uh, we're going to have a very special show on Monday with all the co-hosts. Uh, we're going to have a chat about this journey, how it's been so far. And I'm very thankful for all the guests who accepted our invitation and were so keen to come and chat with us. Um, I think, uh, sometimes I think it's clear, but I, I, I have to remember that every time there's a new person watching the show and there's someone just discovering if, discovering us right now. So welcome. And this is a conversation. This is a chat. We own up to our ignorance. If you think that something that we said was not right, please feel free to get in touch and say what you think. And you might end up here having a chat with us. Be careful with the judgment of like, oh, you shouldn't. You, we're opening a space. We're all learning here. Okay. We are an alternative platform. We like to have conversations. I do believe that when you listen to someone, you become more compassionate about that person, maybe even more empathetic. You don't know what the other people, the other person is going through. So let's practice this beautiful thing of active listening and practice dialogue. Okay. I came with my feminist t-shirt as well, because there's been some controversy about that lately. We're all pro, man. Just go and do your thing. Be nice to people. If you're doing something that is good for other people, we'll support it. Okay? Um, my heart and my, my, my everything, my soul, my emotions go with all those people in America. I was just reading about that. I was having a chat with Taylor, mass shootings, and we keep talking about guns and everything. Hey, let's be nice to each other. Let's pay attention to what's happening to our neighbors, to our community, to our schools. Okay, let's be nice to the children. Let the children talk, listen to them. We don't even know what's going on. Okay, so be nice to your neighbors. Be nice to your friends. Be nice when you go on our, on our live chat. You know, if you want to criticize, you're welcome to. But be polite. Okay, it goes a long way. On my left, Brett Soanis. How are you, my man? I am good. How's your back? <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Does it? Yeah. Ah, God damn it. Why? I don't know. I think it's a. I think it's the curse of being being taller as well. You know. Okay. I've got a few friends who are tall and they have sore back, so I think it's something like that. Would you go for a chiropractor? Yeah, we're just saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. What are we... I don't know. I've never <laughs> been to one. Maybe that fix me first time. I know? haven't. I haven't. Maybe been, they wouldn't. I haven't been to one either. Maybe they're just like witch doctors, and all they do is make you feel better for a little bit, and then, and then you're back to being sore again. I don't know. I don't. Although know. Although I feel like a witch doctor would probably do a real good job. Mm. But I, I've, I've heard so many different points of views on it, so, so mm. many different opinions, people who loved it and, and felt great, and some people who didn't feel good at all. Would yeah. you give it a go, though? Yeah, for sure. Yeah? Any chiropractors out there want to practice on my back? Learning, Any chiropractors learning, out there? Learning chiropractors, like just beginning, so they're cheap. <laughs> <laughs> great. Mm. Have you been to a chiropractor, Ian? Uh, I have in the past, yeah. yeah. Did oh. it help? Uh, it did, yeah. Yeah? I'd probably pick someone who's experienced, nothing oh. against learning stuff, but mm. yeah. They've got to learn somewhere, though. My body's a, well, the opposite of a temple. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I'm An not, exercise I'm, yard. I'm not going to comment, but yeah. <laughs> so. Here tonight we have Ian Priest, the photographer, artist, Kuatuna personality, must say. Uh, Kuatuna. Yeah, yeah. so, <laughs> nice to meet you guys, yeah. <laughs> Nice to meet you. Thank part you so much the, for what, coming. What was it? The Teen Artists? Part of the Teen Artists? Yes, I am one of the ten, yeah. Kind of two new art group. So, yeah, we exhibit regularly there. So, yeah. Self-acclaimed yeah. best artist of the ten? I heard uh, you say that earlier. No, I said I wouldn't answer that question. <laughs> there, <really. laughs> so, just for the people who don't know what we're talking about, what, what is the ten um, Quartuno artists? Oh, so it's uh, an art group we formed about four years ago. So, it's myself and a friend who's not... Uh, in the art group, Isabel, and we just wanted to get a group of us together. We're blessed, I mean, the Coromandel's blessed with artists, but we're blessed in Kuatuni mm. with having some really excellent ones. Um, and we just formed this group and start putting an exhibition on once a year. 
and it just really picked up through the community. And the first year we put it on, we were getting posts out through Auckland. We had visitors from Auckland coming over, and it's become a bit of a fixture uh, in the calendar. So we actually skipped it. It's usually every uh, anniversary weekend, January. So we skipped it this year because of the lockdown. Mm. But we just decided a couple of weeks ago we're going to run it at Labour Weekend. Ooh. So you heard it here first. Mm. Um, yes. So, so, yeah, it's really cool to be involved in a local group. Um, but also we've got some really noted, uh, famous artists, some real talent there as well. So yeah, it's good actually. It's good. Where, do you, where does that run? Is it like is that at the Curitunu Hall or? It is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Uh, which is really it's a really neat place to exhibit. They they did it up mm. recently and they put it's a cool new little floor. building. Eh, it's for excellent. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So we get that for a long weekend and put an opening evening on, put some food, put some wine, get the locals around, the visitors. So yeah, it's mm. a good thing. Nice, nice, yeah. nice. And you also have another exhibition coming up, right? Yes. Yes. Do, yeah. Let's talk about that first, because I'm sure we're going to bring it back at the end of the show. But um, a lot of people are watching us right now. So let's do it. What's yep. happening? Uh, so it's an exhibition that um, I've been on my mind to do for about two years. And obviously, again, the impact of the lockdown, COVID, etc., uh, which thankfully we're mo we are not out of, but we're moving out certainly the lockdown. And it was with a couple of friends and local artists. One was Roy Marta Taimana, who has been on the show just recently. Yes. Another is Philip Fickling. And we all do art very differently. Our end product is very different. Um, but we were chatting earlier about this, all storytellers in our own way. And I think for me, it was about a, a collaboration where we could explore the different ways that we saw things and the different things that we created on the different pro processes. But ultimately, for each of us, there's something to be read into the work and to be seen. Mm. Um, that was one element of it. The other element is, I think Roy Marsh and Phil are just, um, and I hope they're not listening to this. Oh, they will be. Man. They'll be here. Well, they're, they're okay. They're not bad, you know. No, <laughs> they're, um, they're real. I think real creative, you know, really creative geniuses in my book, the way they create things, the things they see, how they take an idea and turn it into a finished product. So, and they're also really good friends. So. I like the collaborations. I've, I've done a lot of solo exhibitions. I've been running exhibitions probably for 12 years as a as a semi and then, you know, full-time professional uh, photographer. But I like the collaborations because you get different ideas, you see different work, you get a different energy. Uh, it helps you see things in a different way yourself, so you feel challenged. And it's nice also to work with people who aren't photographers. Um, it's not a, that I don't like competition. Maybe it is. I don't know. I'm not <laughs> going to explore that route. But it's really cool to work with guys who just come up with different things and see different things. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. The three of us are in. We're calling it um, Lens, Pens and Paper. So my friend Isabel coined that, which is the different medium that we, we work in. So obviously Lens, Camera, Roy Marta primarily works in ink, though he's got some digital artwork um, going to be on show for the first time. And Phil makes these amazing um, three-dimensional constructions out of cardboard and paper, which there's always a kind of story embedded or rolled into that work. Uh, yeah, and the dates, actually, we start, uh, we got an opening night on the 3rd of June, the Friday. Cool, cool. And then we Next Friday, coming Friday. Uh, it's a week away, yeah. It's a long it's a week weekend day. Eh? Yeah. yeah, no, I'm, yeah. I just found my stress levels going up, but they're actually about a week to go. Queen's apparent birthday. Apparent yeah. birthday, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, but we're running it from um, the long weekend of Queen's birthday through to Matariki. Oh, and yeah. we were talking today about we'll do some, we'll have the, um, the opening night Friday, but we'll do something around Matariki. It's the first time it's a public holiday. Mm. Romata's going to, we'll do some music. Fantastic. We'll do something laid back. <clears throat> and yeah, we're up three weeks. Uh, we do, we're open midday to four o'clock weekdays and then 10 till five uh, holidays and weekends. Cool. How much the the tickets? How oh, it's much? free, free it's entry. Free, free Yay. to get in, free to get in. It's really expensive to get out, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, there's a lot of people there by the time the Maori New Year rolls around, right? There should be. Yeah, yeah. We're, 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 we're hoping you'll have quite the collection. As a as a you say you're doing it like as a collaboration. Mm. So, what does does Oi Mata like draw something and then you take a photo of it and then sorry, what was the other guy's name? Phil. And then Phil like gets those photos and makes them into like a sculpture? Uh, not in that way, actually, <laughs> which would be, would be interesting That'll to be try. Cool. Next, I was just next, curious next on how, you, how, you, uh, how the collaboration works, or is it like, are, are, the, are the pieces actually physically like to do with each other, or just the three of you putting on a, a show together, like collaborating together in that respect, you it, know? It, it's more the latter, the bit that we, so we don't physically connect the works together. The thing that connects us is the, 
the theme about exploring our own worlds through our work. Okay. So yep. you know what Roy Marta will do amazingly. You've you've seen what he does. He mm. he will create these amazing illustrations which bring in his culture, his spirituality, his history, his physical environment, and he creates them as he goes. They're quite incredible. In fact, I've got a little time lapse video I'm going to put on our Facebook page in a couple oh. of days showing how he does it. Um, well, I say how he does it. I have no idea how he does it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I can see him doing it. Magic. Yeah, it is, literally. Um, mm. And so, yeah, we, not, so we don't actually create works together, but it's more about the theme of that mm. idea oh. and how each of us would build around that idea. Mm-hmm. Um, and the point, I think, for the, I guess, another element of the... You can have that one for free if you want, if you want to do something like that. I think we will, actually. In fact, I've got about a week to organise <laughs> yeah. that. So yeah. I'll be, in fact, do you mind if we go now? <laughs> Sorry, man, got to finish soon. <laughs> um, and the other thing I should say about collaboration, <clears throat> excuse me, is um, for the public, it also creates yep. Yep. diversity, creates more interest, there's more to see. Mm. Um yeah, and it's just good. It's a bit of a buzz. So. It's like going to a festival, eh? And you know that there's more than one band playing, and then you mm. get a vibe, and then the bands love seeing the other musicians, and you know that there's an energy. Yeah, that's right. About that thing happening, so it's beautiful what you guys are doing. And uh, mm. well, we had a chat with Roy Mata, and we haven't had yet with with Phillips, but I yeah. think now it would be a cool thing to mm. to get to know him and yeah. have a chat. Yeah, it'd be good to get. He's a good man, Phil. I like him a lot. Yeah, Ian. Um, what are your first memories of like being in a in a in a picture like family setting up for a picture like those those photo families you know like when oh. how 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 long do you bring it like how far would you bring that those memories back oh man there's a question um <laughs> two memories actually the earliest one which i've actually got a photograph of was, was going to our local park i must have been two or three so I can't even remember this. And my dad had a camera and he was a photographer. He used to take pictures of all sorts of things. And there's a picture of me running in the park. And oh man, I was like, I was built. I was this really hefty. I was obviously ate a lot when I was a kid and I was running towards my dad. And I've got this picture, which I, I sometimes use when, I do, when I'm doing talks of this little kind of tubby kid <laughs> running towards his dad. And that was the first image that was ever taken of me. Um, but the first, it's an interesting question. The first time I remember being interested in photography, um, I was probably six or seven and I've been on my mom to get me a camera. And for Christmas, she got me this little kind of instamatic thing. And the first picture I ever took um, was of a dog in our local park. And I I got this shot and I remember being so completely disappointed in the results (laughs) because it just didn't capture what You got the bum of the dog. I did, yeah. It was like the dog looking really disinterested and not engaged at all. Mm. And I don't know, it's like, it was like, oh my God, I thought, I don't know what I thought I'd expect. Like I thought Mm. I'd get an image that I looked at and I go, that's amazing. Which is actually what I still look for in my photography now is Mm. that, you know, you see something, you have an emotional connection and you want to get an image that you can look at later and kind of relive that, if you will. It doesn't have to be a literal image. Mm. Um, and yes, I still remember that. This, it was, I remember it was an Alsatian dog in our local park and it was terrible, so that was it, yeah. <laughs> and then you mentioned your father being a, a photographer. Yeah. What about your mum? No, not really. My mum, we were, um, mum was, I mean, basically was a working mum. So, we, you know, there were, there were three of, or five of us, um, two brothers. So mum not particularly artistic. She was a great dancer, my mum, actually. Cool. God, I didn't know we'd start with all this stuff, actually. But yeah, she was an amazing <laughs> dancer. So Irish Catholic background, very flamboyant, very out there, um, really expressive, really right. yeah, passionate woman. My dad was more kind of introverted, I think. Would, would, would your father take pictures of her dancing? Do you, do you remember something like that, of, oh. of taking pictures of you guys as, as a... As a photographer, were you part of his, his, his project? His canon, as it were. Um, <laughs> not, not of my mom. It's interesting. Yeah, not of my mom so much, actually. They weren't that close. It was kind of right. slightly. Like, in the end, okay. they, they okay. kind of went their own ways. Right. But there were quite a few shots of us as kids. Um, and so when I say he was a photographer, he used to take snapshots. But he's the only person when I was younger, I think, I knew who had a camera. And he was mm. quite interested in it. But yeah. Did he make a living out no, of it? Not no, not on no. that. He was an IT guy. So, oh, yeah. right. Well, we didn't call it IT then. I think we called it. <laughs> he had a spanner. So yeah, he was going to say, did he have some oil and he mis- oiled the machine? <laughs> yeah, literally, I think it was. They used to wind it up, you know, then go off. Wow, that's cool, though. So you, you from, from an early age, w- were you into that? Or that was dad's thing? Like, were you already wrapping your head around that work with technology and what was happening? Or that was not even... No, so my early... 
forgot when did I start actually. Um, it's a long time ago. I'm trying to Here remember. Here we go, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. There you go. We've <laughs> got Some, time. Somebody remind me, I was born in the last millennium, which is a bit scary. But anyway. Um, <laughs> No, I think the earliest thing I remember catching on to, um, in fact, we were chatting about this earlier, Brett, was it was a connection, um, just interested in outdoors. And I, that's, mm. I, I studied geology and did a degree and worked in the industry. And the primary reason was I still remember looking at books because where I was born in Hart, industrial Merseyside, there weren't a lot of mountains and kind of wild landscapes. But I remember seeing these books with these amazing pictures. I remember thinking, well, how would they be formed? Just the shapes and the structures. And I was fascinated mm. in what would have caused them and that kind of took me down the early route of i guess initially wanting to go work in places like that which i did um and i suppose my photography kind of coming full right to the end of that journey is living here which is the most you know i still think very incredibly fortunate to live here um blessed really but to be able to go and photograph some of these places and connect with them in a in a different way mm -hmm. um yeah, so I don't know if that's, that's yeah, yeah, but yeah. so so you said that you studied uh, geology. Mm. So was that a big part of your career at some stage of actually going to the places and photographing and documenting and studying and taking to people like as part of the the study? Did you get that deep into uh, the? So not so that I I did work as a geologist. I spent about eight years working all over. Um, I did. America, Europe, Africa. Uh, the photography wasn't part of the job, um, but the reason I got into it, one of the guys on the crew we worked on, so we'd work, I was in the field, so we'd work out a field crew and I used to manage a small crew myself. So we had a, we had a couple of Land Rovers and we'd just go driving off doing stuff. It was quite random actually, but great fun. <laughs> um, and one of the guys I worked with, his dad bought a photography shop and he just turned uh, up one day with all this gear and started oh. taking these pictures. And it just became one of those things that everybody on the crew got a camera so wow. that was my first film camera uh, which i've still got actually uh, back at home and that's what started it really and it just it was a fascination you know when you're walking around and you see things that catch your eye that you think actually that's met whatever it was you know whether it's a flower a mountain you know i don't know a city or a building or something is just a desire to want to capture an image um and that's kind of where it started and i just got this camera went around taking pictures of all sorts of things really just because i happened to be there so yeah it wasn't it wasn't part of what i was mm -hmm. paid to do now you mentioned uh doing some work in africa yeah how old were you um i would have been well, mid-20s i suppose mid-20s yeah about 10 years ago yeah. which, which yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> am i older than you <laughs> Did it not be? didn't even laugh i can't believe yes, that. That, man. <laughs> he's always worried about age man no, when, you make, when you say something about age you get breath man <laughs> i can away. categorically without even checking you are not <laughs> you are not older than me no. <laughs> which, which which country <laughs> i can't believe that's a result <laughs> <laughs> You'll take that one. <laughs> Brent was Thanks, just man. saying, was just asking uh, Ian before we started the show about his hairstyle because it looks so good. He was curious if if, if mm. Ian is looking after. Can I just say that's man. not exactly what he said. There's no way he said. <laughs> what, what did you, how, how did you say it, Brent? You put it in a better know. way. I don't know. Yeah. What did I say? Yeah. You probably right? said it looks amazing hey, or something. It looks like amazing. That. You said it was. Do you do your own hair? Do you that, do that your own hair? That was the question. Yeah, it was yeah. the question. <laughs> like I said, I was going to give a shout out to my hairdresser, but I yeah. don't think I will now. <laughs> no, well, you squash a little with your headphones now, anyway. So. Oh, yeah. damn. Sorry, yeah. guys. I should have we'll, worn a hat. Anyway, sorry. I'll get the no. earplugs next time, man. <laughs> yeah. Which countries did you go uh, in Africa? So I was in Morocco. So we were doing a survey um of uh, in the atlas mountains actually so it was um really small crew four of us and we were working for it was the italian oil agency Adship, who got a contract in morocco and we were looking for oil um i can c confidently say we never found any but we were just we used to do remote sensing um mm. if i wander off too far in the detail let me know but we would do things like magnetic and gravity surveys at the surface so you're looking at um, like magnetic anomalies, gravity anomalies that tell you a bit about the shape of the ground. So, and ultimately, if you want to find out what's there, you drill a hole. Well, we weren't doing that. So we just, I, I, my job is actually to walk around the Atlas Mountains for six months with a pack taking measurements. So not the most exciting job, but great experience. Oh, really yes. enjoyed that. So yeah. there would be a, obviously not the measurement part but like the rest of it would be pretty sweet though eh? oh yeah like walking around and yeah just yeah yeah wow um, yeah sounds cool <laughs> yeah it sounds amazing oh it was oh no it was fantastic i just actually. walk around a house all day you know <laughs> <laughs> 
taking <laughs> measurements, funnily enough. Maybe I could be a geologist. Yeah, sure. See if it's flat or flat away. This is a bit different. Do you want to see if it's flat yeah. and, and, and right? Eh? You're not looking for the... Yeah. Not looking for the bumps. Um, yeah, so I, I, I love Morocco, actually. And it was... Um, I like cooking as well. I should, I should have mentioned that. I um, trained as a chef quite a number of years ago. And yeah. the thing I loved about Morocco was that mixture of um, Arabic and French food, mm. the mixture of the styles. And I just love that. You know, you've got the spices, you've got the fruits and the different combinations. So that was a real thing that I loved about going there as well. So, yeah. Do you, um, you don't photograph people that much from from what i saw is that is that correct you 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 more like nature in in, in landscapes landscapes do you like people uh, <laughs> what about do you get along with them like I, I'm, i'm joking as a social person so like <laughs> i meant it so <laughs> me <laughs> I was wondering if you did like artistic. We just met and, and, you, and you sound like the coolest guy. But um, what yeah. I meant was like when you go on a trip, like on a place like that, are you interested in actually having a chat, or you more like pay attention to the landscapes, to what's happening around you, or you like that that connection oh, with people? It depends where I am. I mean, I, I, I choose to photograph here, and we chose to live here because of the, the natural environment, and it is amazing. You know, we might talk a bit later about the natural history here. It is absolutely unique, and I think to be, you know, to be you know valued and protected. But it depends where you go. When I was in um, um, in India, where I started my photo photographic career, um, it's hard not to photograph people there. And there's something, I guess, I don't know whether it's voyeuristic about going to a culture that's not like your own and you feel like you want to photograph people. Um, I'm always, it's always an interesting one, the kind of uh, etiquette of doing that as a photographer. Because like, how would I feel if I was sat at Luke's at Kuatun and somebody comes in taking pictures of me without asking? Um, but there is that, you know, when you're away, and you know, we did a trip around Rajasthan and I started taking a lot of people shots there because that's what was interesting. And I actually used that as part of a portfolio to get my accreditation with the Royal Photographic Society. Hmm. And a lot of that was people shots, but it's a, it's the subject of what's there. So I do photograph people. Uh, I suppose while I'm here, I tend not to. Um, I have done some commission work um, photographing people in conservation groups. Uh, you know, we're protecting the, the animals and, you know, looking after the environment. Um, I have done the odd wedding for friends and family, hmm. which, um, which is fine. I hope fine. so. You're a literal photographer. Right? I, 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 that'd be not the first thing they ask. Oh, we know a photographer. Yeah, yeah. And I, I say, could you just kind of look, look a bit like a wetter and then I'll get you? you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's not what I made you I, I do do it. And I actually ended up, it was, a, it was a kind of crazy year. I think the whole COVID thing for everybody has been mm. a... Are crazy. I mean, I do a lot of photography workshops, but during the lockdown, they stopped. Uh, but I picked up a whole load of work. I was doing fashion shoots this year oh. as well, which was really uh, fascinating, actually. So, but my primary thing, what I, I like to do and I like to teach is photographing the environment. That's kind of my thing, really. Right. So yeah. when you are, so when you're teaching people around here, do you, do you have your favorite places where you take them or you you kind of like play by what's happening with the weather, with the what's what's going on. Like how 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 do you create yeah. this package for people and this opportunity? Because it sounds like an amazing opportunity to photograph in the Coromando. Oh, it's pretty, it's pretty good actually. Um, so it's a bit of both. I do have locations that I like to go to, and I I'm always expanding that and always looking for new places. Um, but it is always weather dependent. Um, so if you're photographing by the sea. What's the cloud doing? What's the, is it raining? Is it not raining? What are the tides doing? Which way is the wind blowing? You know, if it's a sandy beach, it's good in certain weather. If it's a rocky beach in other weather, if it's going to be really cloudy and damp, then that's good for forest photography. It's good for macro. So I've got a quite a long list of places and I go to those places because I like it. And they're not, they're more, some of them are kind of on the tourist trail, not many actually. And that's not out of any particular reason, but, um, But so I've got quite a big list and then I do decide on the day what I do. Um, I've kind of expanded the workshops in the last couple of years as well. So I, I, I was running them in uh, Tiri Tiri Matangi where they've got the, the bird, um, bird sanctuary there, which is the most amazing place to photograph birds. I think the best place I've been to in New Zealand for certain reasons. Um, I do workshops in Great Barrier Island. So I've got one starting on Friday for five days um, as well as an exhibition when I get back. So no pressure. Um, <laughs> And actually I did one for the first time, actually I ran a workshop over in um, near Apotiki in Ahiwa, um, further, you know, towards the East Cape um, with a client who we just kind of did a bit of a road trip. So I've kind of oh, got my list, but it's, it's developing really. And I'm quite, I like to be flexible and I like nice. to be a bit creative in what I do. So, yeah. 
And you manage your time well. Do you feel like you 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 are good at booking things and making sure that you're giving yourself time? Because it's quite a cre it is a super creative process, you know, to be attentive and to be yeah. sharp. And then you start to do a lot of things, and then you're like, oh man, yeah, I cannot lose that that you know the thing. How how do you work? Oh, with your <laughs> do I manage my time well? Uh, <laughs> I, I always feel like I never have enough time. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Good. I can never have enough time, and I do quite a number of other things as well. But I, I think if you're doing anything that's involving a client in any context, is you've just got to be in that zone and be. And I love the workshops actually. It's quite nice because it, in a way, it simplifies my life. If I'm on a workshop with a client, that's it. That's what I do. Yes. And all the other stuff is like then I feel you know it's all oh, that was great. Then I come back and I go, oh, God, there's my to-do list of forty-five things. So. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It's I think that's an interesting thing running your own business. I was chatting to a, a friend the other day about it. Is um, you don't have a day off, and you've got you, there's no structure. Now, if you're working for an employer, even if you're doing sixty, seventy hours a week, there is a structure around that. Mm -hmm. If you're doing your own thing, anything you haven't done, and this is you've got to be got to be careful. Anything you haven't done, you can beat yourself up over. And it's and I'm really bad at my partner shields. Always having a go at me about you know being less hard on myself and just giving myself some time away. And I think that's, you know, the number of people I know have got their own businesses is an eternal challenge of how you, how you manage that. But I wouldn't swap it, I love it, so yeah. That's good. Are you good at photography, is Brett? <laughs> I've, got a hundred, I've got thousands of photos, yeah. um, <laughs> but it definitely doesn't, no, I'm not very good at photography. I, you know, I've, I sometimes take a photo that I'm like, I don't take any thought out photos, let's put it that way. Because I was, uh, it, it's funny you ask that because I was thinking, like when I take photos, I try to not almost even look in the, I only mean, use them on my phone, yeah? Yeah. But like, I try not to look at the, like I look at it as I'm taking it, but then I try not to look at it because I've, I've, I've heard these things, you know, about people who like live their lives through like the lens of yeah. their cat and all they're doing is, is looking like this, you know, like through the, yep. through the thing. And it's like, I was wondering this, I was going to ask, but uh, how do you, how would you, how do you get away from that as a photographer or is it not a problem for you as a photographer? Because like the camera becomes an extension of you, you know what I mean? Cause yeah. like, I feel like I'm like, Okay, I don't want to look if it's a sunset or something, right? And I'm like, I'll take some photos of the sunset, and then I'll be like, but I'll be looking at the sunset yeah. and taking some photos because I want to try and experience it, not just photograph yeah. it and walk away. Yeah. You know, if that makes no, that makes it's, sense. So, no, it's a really, really good question because I think it is easy to get lost behind the camera. So, if the only objective, if you go in, so particularly somewhere new, and you think, well, all I want to do is get some pictures of this place, I mean, you do lose the experience. I think it's easy in a couple of ways. One is if you're going to get a decent picture, whether you've planned it or not, you really need to be looking at the scene first. So if I'm when I'm you know teaching people or coaching or whatever the word is, um, if you go to location, the first thing you do is not pick up the camera. You just look at the scene and look at what your eyes are connecting to, mm. and just see. And the first thing is is looking for that emotional connection with the thing that you're seeing. Or do you like what you, you know? Do you like the sunset? And then okay, well if I like it. What is it that I'm seeing that I'm, and, uh, you know, I'm appreciating? And then you start to think about, well, what might that look like in a lens, you know, through a lens or through, you know, through a phone? And then you pick the camera up. So I think to get good photographs or photographs that you I mean good in the sense that you connect with them yourself, you need to use your eyes first. And then the other part, which I find also quite easy, is now and again, just put the camera down, just sit there and watch it, you know, because that's... Mm. There's a real joy in that. And if you get back later and you think, well, I really, that was an amazing place to be and thing to see. And actually, I've also got a picture which brings back the feeling of that experience because that's mm. what it is. And you know, the image to me is the thing that you can never capture it, but it can bring the feeling back of the thing that you mm. saw. So, yeah, I don't, I think it's a really good question. I think people do get caught in that. I, I feel I have in the past. You see it with tourists a lot, eh? Hey? You do, yeah. You know, like, yeah. especially. Well, I mean, not that we see it very often <laughs> lately because we don't really have tourists. <laughs> it's not here, yeah. But you definitely see, like, um, you know, tourists when they come overseas and they're obviously excited to be in the country mm -hmm. and they're just like, chick, 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 chick with the camera, oh. you know, and it's like, I, I do wonder, you know, I'm like, man, have you gone home? And then you're like, you look at the photos and you go, like, I don't even remember that place or whatever, you know, because all you're doing was just capturing, yeah. you know, taking, because when you say all that now, I feel like I've only ever taken like two photos in my life. Yeah. Well, I've actually, <laughs> well, I've actually gone. I'm going to 
work out how I want to take this photo. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because, like, it's funny because I, I don't really know, well, I do know a couple of photographers, but we've never really talked about photography, you know, and it's just sort of like photography is just taking photos, you know, but then you realise when you get a photographer in here, it's not just taking photos. Yeah. <laughs> there's, like, a lot that goes to it, you know, there's a literal art, right, you know? Yeah, like, I think so. I mean, it's what, how you see and how you interpret that through a camera. Mm. Um Probably in the same way, I don't know, like I look at Roy Marta, is he sees something or he feels something, perceives something, and how does he create that through a pen or through, you know, how does he do it? Um, yeah, I, I think, um, I suppose it is, an, it is an art in that sense. I always used to struggle calling mm. myself an artist, but um, maybe several other people do as well, I don't know, but mm. it is an art. You're, you're, it, there is a degree of interpretation. There's a, there's a view of what do I see how do I turn it into an image? Mm. And I think the thing about that, you know, less is more, taking a bit longer to think about what you're doing and taking a few less images um, is going to give you better results, more satisfying results than just taking hundreds and hundreds, mm. getting bored looking through them. Because I'm trying to find one like oh, yeah, or whatever. You know, and then saying, oh, I always wonder when people take hundreds of images, I shouldn't be disparaging, but you think, Who's going to look at them? You or your family? You know, imagine yeah, I've, yeah, I've just yeah. come back from a holiday in New Zealand and I've got 4,000 pictures I took. Now you're going to put on Facebook and make other people look at that's your true. children's <laughs> beauty. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I, I was thinking about a question regarding this appreciation towards something because like, I don't know, it seems to me like each generation will praise something that they were doing at their times, you know, yeah, like, oh, yeah. our times, you know, like, so I think... For, for me at least, and maybe for my parents, it's, it's, it's a common thing to say, oh, so good when we used to have the albums, you know, mm. all those pictures organized mm. and like, and how, how much was the film? 12, 24 or 36 pictures that you could take yep. with the film, you know, like, and you have those albums and, you, and, and then you see one that is a, bit, a little bit thicker, you were like, wow, that must have been a, a very important trip. We took like maybe five or six rolls, you know, to, to get a lot of memories yeah. from there. And then, now completely different you know like the way that we store pictures like yeah. not many people bother printing the pictures anymore mm -hmm. like uh, um, and, and having them as a physical thing and just like you guys were saying like we take so many you mm -hmm. know it's just a thing so but at the same time it's it's a transition you know like for the young people coming it's just the way that it is yeah you know there's not going to be like a comparison thing they'll be able to tell oh they'll be able to praise an album i yeah. guess yeah but it doesn't take any value of what's happening now. No. How does it feel for a photographer though, for someone who praises, praises that moment and pays attention to the shot that it's worth it so much mm. when you have people like doing da, 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 Yeah. Like, um, I, I don't know about people taking lots and lots because I try not to, um, I don't always achieve that. And I'll sometimes get on from a shoot with a, a couple of, I've been away for a few days with a few thousand images, which is always hard, but not hard, it just takes time. Um, I, th I think it's, a, it's actually a really good question about the, the changing ways that we look at images, um, you know, over over time and the different ways we, and I suppose in the way that you guys have got the studio here and the way that, you know, just images, you know, video, moving images, sound, the whole thing, we're finding so many more ways of accessing these things. Topping uh, up oh, water. Thanks. Um, so I don't think there's an answer, So, but some thoughts on mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I, yeah. I suppose the, um, I'm not dismissive at all of social media. I think there's, you know, without getting too far into that debate, there's clearly some things about social media, the way it's used, but I think that's just people, you know, social mm. media creates a platform <laughs> for people and it makes it more immediate, makes it easy to communicate to more people more quickly. But, you know, we do what we do. The element that I really like um, is, the, is the bit where you can share images and you can mm. put your work out and people can see I can see other people's work. You can, you know, you don't want to put too much of a narrative, but you can even say, "Look, took this thing," and you know, you can put some comments around it. Um, I really do appreciate that. I think, though, for an, Im an image, you can only really appreciate the quality of it if you print it. So, even with the best cameras and the best screens, the quality of the physical print is always going to be higher. Things like the resolution, the color rendition. So, it's one of the reasons I really like exhibiting work is through use of different media. So you can print on all sorts of different stuff, glass, wood, um, perspex, aluminium. And mm. it just gives you a, a much better appreciation of that image. And I think the other thing that is really powerful, like you talk about photo books, is it's much easier to share. 
So mm -hmm. if you've got a book, I mean, I've got so many images on my computer I've taken. The only time I ever really get to share them is when I've printed them, even with family. So I think there's, um, what's the simple answer to that? Well, there isn't one, but I think there's, there's different media and they all have a different role. Um, and like I say, the thing I, like I mentioned, the social media thing, it's a window. I see it as a window to share my work. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's great. And I've got a number of people who comment, give, leave nice comments and engage with. Um, so yeah, I think there's a role for everything, but I, I think physically printing work, you can't, I, I think there's always a place for that, you know, personally, so yeah. I was reading that you you are partner with a uh, with a filter as the N I S oh, Nissi uh, Nissi yeah. Can you explain what that is for us, please? What that you is. Could? So one of the uh, one of the aspects of photography um, that you can use are filters, and the reason you use them, I explain what they are, is if you're shooting water that's mm -hmm. moving, could be a sea, could be a waterfall, could be a river, and you'll see on my website I've got a bunch of these of different types of effects, so you can you can get a motion effect from water um, by basically having longer and longer exposures, you know, a second, five seconds, 10 seconds. And the way that you can create that is basically put something in front of the lens that blocks the light out. So if I was taking a picture of a river, for example, and I thought, well, I quite like the effect, but I'd like to see that water kind of streak out a bit mm -hmm. more and move around the rocks in a more kind of abstract way, then I could use a filter. And so that's basically one of the main reasons. Um, the other one is if you're taking a picture of the sea in the morning, um, the sky is always brighter than the beach, um, typically. So one of the things, the, the filter, I only use two types. I use one to kind of slow, slow motion down. The other one is you get a filter where half of it's dark, half of it's light, mm -hmm. and you use it to balance the light off, which is mm -hmm. always better than doing that in Photoshop. So the philosophy very strongly for me is, do as much in camera as you can, because A, you reduce the work you've got to do, but also, you know, there may be people listening to this and go, actually, I disagree. And Photoshop is an amazing thing. Not to hell with those guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're not here. That's great. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 I always think if you overwork an image, it's obvious. And, you know, yep. and I'm sure I've got images out there that I've overworked to people going, yeah, I've seen your stuff. And it's but, a physical yeah. filter. Yes. Like yeah. a literal light filter. Piece of glass, basically. Yeah, oh, okay. it is, yeah. Yeah, wow. yeah, cool. And so what it is, you stick it in front of the camera and you've got a range of them in different ones. So I used to use filters from an English company who were really good, but then um, I tried, it's actually a client of mine who bought some Nissi filters and I was amazed at the results. So I just wrote to them and said, actually, um, I want to get some filters. And they came back and said, yeah, we'll do a partnership deal, uh, which is great. So it's, it's, it's um, I think for me, if you're photographing anywhere where there's water, um, the filters to me are just they're almost as, as essential as having a lens, basically, to get the effects that, mm -hmm. I, that I go for. So you can't do those effects, <clears throat> like, can you do those effects on, I know, I know you're saying not as good as on face, uh, Facebook, on Photoshop. Mm. But let's like, say the the water motion one, c can you do them? Um, or is I, this the filters are like the the way? That's the only way to do it. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff you can do in Photoshop, blurring effects and all sorts of other stuff. I'm sure somebody who had spent an awful lot of time studying it could do something to maybe replicate it. In direct answer, I can't know. Mm. But then I, it's not something I've ever wanted to do. I'd rather be out there yeah, yeah, taking yeah. a picture, come back and go because the art is in taking the picture you know, manipulation is it, you know, you have to, it's like, you, you know, you, like when they used to develop films, the, f the image used to get manipulated when you were kind of developing the negative. Um, there's got to be some work on it, but it's to me, you know, less is more again, the less you do, the more you get it in camera, the, the better in the end it's going to be. And do you do that? Do you develop your own film? No, I don't. Well, I just shoot digital now. So I've got a film oh, camera. Yeah. I just, um, I get asked that quite Did you used to? Uh, no, I didn't. No, because no, we used to do that. As my dad used to take quite a lot of photos. Oh, yeah, he's got these big bloody albums of us. I always thought I was adopted because I was never in them, but mm. I'm in some of them, so I was yeah. there. Um, but we he used to do his own ones sometimes. Yeah, you know? and I remember going like the bathroom, and he'd like pull the the red you know, light. Be, thing. Yeah, or it'd be pitch black in the bathroom. He'd have all the lights blocked off when he did his thing with the film. But then he would go, yeah, with the, we had like an amber light and then he'd have them with the projector and, you know, and the different solutions yeah. and stuff. So he never got into, never got into that, eh? No, no, I didn't. It's not no. too late. No, no, no exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I asked a lot about using film and there mm. is a place for it. I mean, not just because it's the old school, there is something about the, the blacks in a film are much blacker 
oh, and okay. then there would be with digital. Um, but it's, I think actually I'm still learning the digital platform. There's still new things I'm trying to do. And um, I'd rather stick with, uh, yeah, what I'm doing than, than bring in out of interest. Maybe I, you know, yeah, I don't, so no is the answer. Yeah. No, do you, do you, do it's you, just you, made me sound unambitious actually as I was yeah, answering that yes, question. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> do you play with um, any of those apps that gives you a lot of filters that you can take on your phone? I, I, on the you, phone? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, 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 no. You don't take no, photos don't on your phone? I use the phone a lot actually. I did, yeah. I had a client in recently who um, did a lot of photography on her phone. An amazing eye actually used to get some really interesting shots. Because I mean, the compositional rules about what makes an image work mm. are the same through whatever device you capture it. You know, the con the, mm. the, the color contrast, the the light, the dark, the the, sh the things that you're you're capturing. Um, and she used to get these amazing images on the phone, and she basically came along um, and wanted to learn whether it was worth buying a camera. So I took her out. I got a spare camera, so we used it. And I was saying, like, you, it's either or. The the, the the phones are great. I mean, they're great mm. for spontaneity. They're great for mm being light um and i think they can be used it's, it's an interesting thing I, I did it on a trip recently i went over to the east cape and i didn't take my camera i just i'd been really on i've been really busy and i wanted a break so i just gave myself a challenge of could i get an image every day on my phone that i'd want to post and actually i did and i was happy with it cool. um but the camera just gives you a lot more flexibility it gives you a higher resolution image you can print it yeah. bigger but no, I think and you are... probably you probably don't just use that automatic mode oh. on the top, right? What's that? You don't even have one. On your camera. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't come with that option. Yeah, yeah what yeah. sort of camera do you use? Uh, I'm used... sure someone will be interested out there. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Maybe it's a Canon. Canon, yeah. I, I knew I, it. I started <laughs> camera <laughs> professionals. Yeah. <laughs> so you, I noticed you guys use Lumix actually, which Lumix, is yeah, 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 it's interesting. So I know that's not a sponsor. Posh actually. Not so. yet. No, no, no. If they want not to. Yet, yeah. if, if, if they want to sponsor us. We'll voice over you after this and it'll be like, <laughs> yeah. I use a Lumix. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But um, how was it for you? How was the process of, of finding the perfect camera lenses for you? And oh, the start was easy because when I decided um, to actually pick up photography again quite a number of years ago, because I loved the experience I had with the film camera, and then I stopped. I ended up, like everybody does, ended up doing a different job, being in a different place. But I'd always missed taking pictures, and I do have a fear, I do have a belief that everybody's got their own creative thing, and I think if you don't explore it, it's in the end to your detriment. And I think and I just felt with the camera, I wanted to get one again. So I knew a guy who was a professional bird photographer, a friend of mine. And I just asked him, "What would you get, Canon or Nikon?" And at the time, he said Canon. I think it was to do with the color rendition and the software. They change all the time, and in, mm -hmm. I think. In the end, whatever <clears throat> camera I got, I'm the, I'm the weak link, so it wouldn't really matter. Uh, and I started off with what's called a crop sensor, which is a small sensor, small camera, and I got a set of lenses. And within about a year, I thought, actually, I want to upgrade and do more. And that's when I got a... And I started off, as everybody does, I got a bigger camera, got a couple of lenses. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 years later, I've got lenses all over the place. And you do it bit by bit. Um, the only advice of people out there thinking of buying gear is just make sure you're going to use it. That's all. In, I was I was yeah. wondering about it. If there's anything in your bag that you have a look at it and it's just there accumulating dust and yeah. you're like, damn, I got it. Pro, pro, I don't use my, that much. Probably my lunch, actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there was one lens, actually, because we were chatting earlier about the macro. I love macro work and particularly here because there are, you know, there are some places in uh, around the Coromandel and particularly where there's a sanctuary where they're knocking the predators down. You get some amazing invertebrates, wetters particularly and spiders. And I got a macro lens and shamefully, it took me about a year to get a decent picture out of it. <laughs> and I couldn't, um, I bought it in Scotland actually when we were there and I couldn't work out why I couldn't get it to work. And as somebody who teaches, I shouldn't admit these things, but, and then one day I just well, got- it's a, it's a it's a learning process, right? Yeah, there's always I, something to learn. I guess so, yeah. yeah. And were you standing too close, too uh, far away? Uh, oh, that's my only two guesses. Yeah, yeah. Could have been one of those. I don't know. See, I was no idea. I'm not even sure I turned it on. Actually, I don't know. God knows what I did. And then one day, I just, I just got this amazing shot. And then, and I, I've, it's worked for me ever since. But mm. I don't actually know what it was that I did. <laughs> that was different. Took the cap off. Yeah. yeah that's a good <laughs> that was right. Um, Ian, uh, two, two different scenarios. Um, do you remember place that you went to with? expectations you were like this is going to be great i'm mm -hmm. going to take great pictures here was not that good and the opposite 
a place that you went, you were just like, I'm just going to do this. Let's see how it's going to go. And then you were like, wow, this is fantastic. Uh, Or a situation or just like a a moment that you didn't, you kind of took it for granted and then, whoa. It worked. Um, I'm trying to think of a particular place. One of the things as a a photographer, I don't know if it's the same for other forms of art, is if you go into somewhere that you know is amazing, there's pressure. You think if I go to this place <laughs> and I don't get a good picture, and I did meet somebody in my early days who was a she worked in a in a framers and print shop, who I got chatting to, and she'd given up photography because she couldn't stand the pressure of having to think she had to do something better every time she went out, and so that is something to be aware of. Um, I'm trying to think of places I've been to that I've been to quite a lot actually. Egypt. Like, uh, I've never photographed. Took I've, I've crappy d- photos of the pyramids. I got, I got my thumb. I got my thumb. <laughs> <From> the side. <laughs> hey, it was a great shot of my thumb, though. Um, the, the most, of it, I, I suppose, here I get excited about. Uh, actually, I went to Tiri Tiri, Tiri Tiri Matangi, and I, because um, I work with Canon as well, and they they lent me one of the really big um, zoom lenses, the kind that you look at. You know, the one of those mm. people walk around and you, th- you see these guys, these massive lenses, yeah, yeah. and you're thinking, yeah, really. Like they film it, like they're trying to take a photo of Johnny Depp in the trial, eh? and they're like, yeah. that's, that's two right. meters away, and the camera reaches halfway to them. You know, that's right. Yeah, and he got his eyelash just about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but that was amazing. I was really, uh, I was expecting a lot because I had everything, and I had, and I'd actually done the thing. I've been out before and worked out the locations, um, and yeah, that was amazing. I got the, the one shot actually because I'm really into native birds was the kokako, which is this really rare bird that's really endangered really struggles to live outside of protected areas and a most beautiful creature actually and i got a shot of that which was a massive thing for me so i was really pleased with that um i'm trying to get the other example of things where i was massively disappointed um <laughs> god there must be loads of those actually um <laughs> must be loads of- <laughs> <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just i'll just go on my phone there'll be a lot of shots on there um I can't, you do find one thing because I've just getting ready for the exhibition. I've been going back through on my back catalogue, and what you you do find, and I, I always get asked, do I delete things? And I never do. Mm. But actually, one of the reasons <clears> is you can go back and look at your work and shots that you've thought actually they weren't any good or discarded. Um, you'll pull out again and go, actually they they are worth keeping. And I I just did one yesterday, which was um, um, it was a kind of panorama of the Milky Way and Great Barrier Island. Must oh. uh, great for astronauts. I was going to ask if you do that sort of thing. I do, yeah. Yeah. And I, I took it about two years ago, and as soon as I looked at it, and it's just you know you take a series of shots and you stitch them together, so that is, is Photoshop, and it just yeah. didn't work. And then I I got back to it again and I looked at it. I thought, oh, there might be some mileage in it, mm. and it took a couple of hours because the Astro work, you, you, it does take some some manip- not manipulation but work on it. And it popped up as a shot that I could use. So I'm going to put it in the exhibition. Mm. And so, yeah, I don't know. It's like your eye changes, develops. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. I'm going to poo poo it when I see it. Yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. I know the true history. You didn't. <laughs> even, it's like the prodigal son that returned. You didn't even want it, eh? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I'm not putting it in now. You just, you, oh, you, you, you no, just, I want to see it now. You've talked me out of it. And I'm getting, I'm getting my haircut as well. So. <laughs> looking great man what about <laughs> what, what about the settings what about like what, what are your favorite ones do you like to play with the exposure do you like to play with what about the light? What about, yeah, come on <laughs> right? come on that's right um so i always shoot manual always and all that means is see if you're shooting automatic then the camera's making decisions for you even if you're shooting semi-automatic the camera's making decisions for you and i was shooting manual because then it's me that's making the decisions uh, there aren't that many to make, um, right. so you always want to set this. They're making it bored. Can put the kettle on, but you always want to start off with your aperture because that determines depth of field, as in how much is in focus. So, so that, what is aperture? So uh, I'm going to ask you this for everyone you go through. Is uh, that okay. right? You see, there's not many. No. So when you take a picture, only thirty, right? What's, no, there's only a few. There's only yeah. a few. How long have we got anyway? No, um, it's as long as you want. <laughs> no. Right. So, what, <laughs> so what is aperture like? Seriously. So when you take, so I hear it a lot. Yeah. So when you press the, the shutter when it, when the lens, it's basically how wide. There's a kind of little diaphragm inside the lens. Mm-hmm. It's how wide it opens. So if you think right. like the iris of an eye, not 
dissimilar. Mm -hmm. And the wider it is, the more light it gets in. So like okay. if you walked into a dark room, your iris will expand. Mm -hmm. Apparently does it if you look at someone you're attracted to as well, your iris will expand. So. Oh, interesting. How big am I in right now, do I? She's out of time. <laughs> so, the so midnight not that, show. So not the time period or anything like that, but not. just the actual how wide it will that's right. so, open up. Yeah, so that's the, so the, the, the time period. So is that a percentage? Uh, no, it's a numbering system. One of the problems with cameras, they have these, it's called an f-stop, and they have these really abstract numbers that in themselves don't mean anything. So one of the things about using a camera is learning. It's about effect. You know, if I turn this dial, what does it do? And the thing about aperture is um, if you have it really wide, it gives a really shallow depth of field. Now, what that means, if I'm doing a portrait, so if I wanted a picture of you and I didn't want the shelf behind in focus, mm -hmm. then I can use a wide aperture. Oh, okay. If I was shooting, say you were on a beach and I wanted a picture of you on the beach, but I actually wanted the mountains behind, then I'd use a narrow aperture. So you're, mm. you're making, it's the first thing you decide is how much do I want in focus? Um, mm. And then once you've set that, then you can start looking at the other settings. So um, the shutter speed is how long the shutter's open for. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all linked around how much light do you let in? Mm -hmm. And then is it going to overexpose or underexpose? And that so that that would be just purely your your lighting conditions and and yes. what you'd probably yes. what you would decide on that. Yeah, yeah. it would be. Yeah. So you and you'd, you'd have to set that so you don't want it to be over it like too bright or too dark. And that's where I'd start to use filters. So if I set a certain aperture, had a certain shutter speed, so that it was it was properly exposed. And there's there's a technique for doing that. Uh, you know, uh, what's the word? Uh, foolproof technique for doing that. Mm -hmm. If I felt then actually that's still a bit quick for me because there's some water, that's when I drop a filter in. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so um, and then the only other setting you can play with is the other light sensitivity setting. Mm -hmm. It's a thing called ISO, which you may yeah, you see. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And what that does, um, it it makes the the camera more sensitive to light. So you used to get it with film. So if you're going to go off and shoot a concert at night and you wanted it was dark you get like a high ISO film because it was more more sensitive to light. Oh, okay. But what it does do, it makes it grainier. So you know, when you see some of these pictures at concerts where it's like mm. really, you've got a picture, but it's a bit grainy and a bit spotty, mm. high ISO can do that. Mm -hmm. So um, Is it like when you take a photo at, at night, like or when there's low light or whatever and it gets real grainy? Yes, it, it is. That's, that's, the same that's what it thing. is, yeah. Okay. Yep. So you just work it out the combination of the three and it's all linked to the what you're trying to do so basically they're the three main things that you play with oh. and if you're shooting in manual it's aperture shutter speed and iso mm -hmm. and in the end then it's what speed am i interested in you know am i am i stopping the hand movement effects in the picture am i getting the right effect of the thing that's moving if i'm taking a picture of a bird that's moving is it fast enough so there's these little things that you can mm. choose because you know it's like wings will be blurry or whatever if it's not that's the shutter speed's not fast enough. That's right. The shutter speed. Okay, that's correct. Cool. Yeah. So I feel like I can become a photographer when I leave. Oh, you know? learning. Actually, I've just, well. learning. And I've just taught you everything I know. So. Oh, damn. <laughs> is that there all there is? That's it. Yeah. No, you're not an artist. So take it back now. Yeah. Not at all. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, I was going to ask that. You you said that everyone has a creative thing, and I yeah. personally like I can't sing. I can't like I don't. I want to be able to write, but I can't. I sucked at English, you know, failed mm. English terribly, and I can't play an instrument and I can't draw. Like, I literally can't do any of these things to save my life. Yeah. So, like, <laughs> save my life. Is, <laughs> is photography something that you would need to have? Like, are you an artist? Like, do you, do you like, draw or have anything else that you do and that, and that works well towards photography? So, it's going to the idea of if I can't do anything else, I'll pick up a camera. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, in. yeah, I'm, yeah, in. yeah. I'm, I'm fully he, dedicated. But he does that with everyone who comes here. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, it's not personal. No, no, no I'm not. I'm, <laughs> no, no, I'm not saying question. that. But it, could it be something that? It, could it be something? Because mm. I mean, if I can't draw, man, I can't draw. Yeah. Like I can't even draw a stick figure. Yeah. Like it's like you look at it and just be like, why is its neck so long? <laughs> it's a stick, <laughs> and I'm like, shit, man, I don't know. <laughs> So I'm wondering, like, is it is, is it something that 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 it has more? So, like, my dad, for example, he was really into photography, and he doesn't draw or mm. write or any of these things. But he's really great at like math. He's a real logical thinker. Plays the piano. Oh, but he doesn't nice. play his own music. He just plays like sheet music. Yeah. Because well, I hope he's not watching this. But like, I don't think he's that creative. Mm. But because this is the way I've thought about it over my lifetime anyway, because he's sort of like quite smart guy, 
and a piano is quite almost mathematical and laid out and structured that he's quite good at that but he just plays sheet music because he's not very creative mm. although he's probably going to like see me now and be like i've got all this music i never played um but he also loved like he loved photography he's got, got mm. take heaps of photos and stuff like that so i'm just wondering if it's no i'm not saying i'm not creative at anything so is photography something i can take up but i'm naturally like i love math and science and things like that mm -hmm. as well and i do like photos like i've got a big photo collection of photos that aren't mine that i've got off like social media or yeah. just the internet in general where i've just saved them and things like that and are you more like that are you like are you a creative person or are you a more structured logical person like is math something you're good at or is um, or is or do you write and draw you know um so i don't write so did that not offend you because the first one obviously was about it's, really, yeah. it's, it's good recovery that's why we got time good recovery, yeah. that's why the, the hang format, on i didn't ask that question probably the format is good we don't yeah. pick yeah, yeah, yeah. we don't yeah. cherry pick a quote yeah, yeah. So we no, got so time so to explain sorry it's because i'm just like this blah 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 no, sorry. so yeah. i got offended but it wore off when you were chatting so it's good <laughs> Time heals all wounds, they say. <laughs> That's right. Um, no, it's, it's good. So the answer is is yes. You pick up you pick up a camera and use it. I mean, I think when I'm thinking of creativity, though, I mean, gardening, cooking, making anything, doing anything is is, mm. a, is a form of doing it. Um, mm. What I try and do myself. I mean, I I used to do physics, so I did the optics and stuff. I'm I'm kind of okay with. But actually, I don't think about any of that when I'm pressing the camera. It's just mm. about effects. You know, if I as I said, if I change the aperture, what will that do to how my picture looks? If I change the shutter speed, what will that do to how my picture looks? So you, you break it into two. And the question is, how creative would you be? Well, you probably won't know until you try it, actually, you know, and see. And you might you might find it. It's often easier to teach the, the use of the camera. And some people really struggle with that. I mean, it is just conceptually quite alien to people. Um, it's often easy to teach that. But I think the... The compositional rules, of, rules with photography, I've chatted to a friend about this today, um, evolved from landscape painting initially, that landscape photography. So a lot of those mm. things about what is it about, <clears throat> excuse me, where we put things, mm. what are the, what appeals? So when people are painting, they, they'll connect into that is the same basis for photography. So mm. give it a go, actually. Yeah, yeah man, you should. So you what should, is a good place should. to, what, what would be a good genre to start with for, for a beginner? uh what do you like to photograph what do you like to see um i i mean the stuff i take photos of on my phone was well obviously my kids but everyone's phones mm. are full of that but like other apart from that it would be like landscapes yeah. you know mm. i'll take photos of like <laughs> don't laugh at me but you know like sunsets and it's like beautiful the We're ocean, do, and, the yeah, ocean yeah. and shit like that you know yeah um it's mainly what i mainly what i have on here yeah that's fine i so do mm. i i mean what they always say, I think I would recommend it when you start. Occasionally it. birds. <laughs> yeah, hard on a phone, actually. That's, they're not so good. Yeah. Um, you I, get I close, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> they usually fly away. Yeah, you get mm. the dead ones, they're easier. But, uh, <laughs> but um, no, I think the, the thing about learning and developing <clears throat> as a photographer is is pick something you're interested in, have a project, mm. if you will. And then something mm. could be quite simple is get a sunset that you'd be proud to put on your wall and say to the family, they would agree with you. Yes, we'll, we can sit them on the wall and pick a location that's near your house mm -hmm. so that you don't have to drive three hours and you know, it's not hard to get to. So what you can do is go back the, you know, at that sunset location repeatedly. Don't go for too long at a time. So don't make it onerous, don't make it hard work mm -hmm. and just go back and try it, get to know the place, get to know the area. The other thing you mentioned about your kids is another one is to get a portrait shot of your kids that again, you think actually, I'd like to put that on the wall. And again, they, they often say, mm. <clears throat> learning photography is your family is a great place to start because they're there. So, you know, it's, I don't know how good your photos are, whether they kind of run of the mill or you don't like them, but <laughs> you could work work on- Most uh, of them are run of the mill, I'll <clears> be <throat> honest. Yeah, but you know, with the kids just work <clears throat> on saying, actually, I want to get a portrait shot that really captures, you know, when I look at my son, daughter, whatever, it really captures the feeling I have when I see mm. them. So mm. work on that, and that's one image, and they're there, and and start. You know, that makes you start to think about well, in what mm. light do they look the best? You know, is it mm. better indoors, outdoors? Is there some nice angles I could work on? So yeah, yeah. Um, that's good advice. Thank we, um, of course, it, photography photography is a cool um, profession, let's say, or, or something that we all relate to because we're all you know nowadays have our phone and we love having a camera, but um, sometimes we forget how history 
is documented mm. and, and the importance of those people who are putting sometimes their lives at risk. We just had recently the, the case of someone from the media, an mm. American, I think Israeli, got, sh yeah, got, got killed, shot, yeah. got killed, you know, like, so this thing, you know, that, that the media nowadays, it's, it's, you know, people complain so much about it and then they forget that there's a bunch of humans there yeah. putting their lives at risk. Um, I just wanted to comment a little bit on that, on that side of the profession, you know, like of the people who are putting their lives at risk sometimes to, to, to do something that we all want to check on our phones, yeah. on, on our websites. And, and if you actually have friends and connections who, who do that kind yeah. of more like journalistic work, do or that. if you've done it. Um, I, um, no, I haven't, not the journalistic stuff. I mean, I've, I've probably put myself in danger by climbing up mountains to take pictures, which is mm. a different thing. Uh, you know, my feeling is it's an, ama it's an, it's amazing that people are driven to want to capture those events and, and lift the lid on those stories to the point that their life is in danger. And it's quite an amazing thing to do. I mean, I think generally investigative journalism has been on the decline for a long time. I think, you know, staff photographers at papers and magazines is something that's been declining. And I think over time, there's, there's fewer people capturing those things. And also the war, it's, I think the war is a more controlled environment than it used to be. Mm. But I just respect, you know, I think there's a, there's a lot, you know, I, I guess I, I don't take pictures of things that are challenging that way. I guess there's, a, there's an indirect side of things I photograph, which is about the protection and conservation. And I do know, not in New Zealand, but there are parts of the world, and apparently this year there are more activists being killed in the world, um, you know, environmental activists who are working against the interest of companies than ever before. Mm. So, I, you know, I see that side and I see people who actively work, you know, work to protect the environment. No, I have a huge amount of respect, actually, and I think to be that driven, I think it's really important. If we, if you know, we stop, shine, stop shining a light on these things, then they'll just keep carrying on. And so, yeah, I think it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you did you read about that? The lady who mm -hmm. was covering, uh, well, they, I think it was a conflict, it was like a yeah, refugee's yeah. place that they was right, getting yeah. attacked. In Palestine, yeah. Well, this, this story was, um, the reported story, she, basically she was assassinated and that's what was the story I picked up now. Mm, yep, yep, yep. Yeah, we're into the whole thing about what's truth and what isn't, but it didn't. Not definitely, yeah, because yeah. They, they aimed for the parts that are not protected. Mm -hmm. They have the media vest and the, the helmets, but they sometimes on purpose, they, they aim yeah. on their eyes or on their necks. Mm. So yeah, that was. Media, that's yeah, pretty yeah. hardcore. Yeah, yeah, mm. uh, I always think about that. I'm like, you know, like when I was thinking like, oh, photographers, and then, you know, it can be, you can you can think about the most amazing moments of your life but you mm. can also think about like those crazy paparazzis chasing people you know like and, mm. and making people suffer a lot because of a shot yeah you know like how much is worth it you know to 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 go for that shot and um on that realm um how do you see the markets for photography because like pieces of art they just sometimes they even lose the artistic value. It's just about collectors and people yeah. paying a lot of money for that just to generate more money in the future. It's yeah. not even about the artwork anymore. Yeah. Is it something that photography plays and relates to it at, at some level of like sometimes getting too much from, from what it, it should be and just kind of like escalating from, from the, the work? It's just um, I think it does happen. I mean, it's certainly um, if, if people become collectible in the art world, where actually it becomes an investment rather than you write the intrinsic value or aesthetic value of the work itself, that doesn't, you know, it does happen. Uh, can't say it's happened to me. I'm not at that level, you know, right? Kind of my pictures are going for a million pounds each. Be nice. Um, hey, yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think what has changed in the market actually is with the advent and spread of digital. And I think with phones as well, there is a there is a view that actually anybody could take an image. I do think that that was the early stage of digital. Suddenly everyone had a digital camera thinking, well, I could I can take a picture just as well as anybody else. And I think that um, ended up devaluing the market. Print sales particularly, I think, became harder for people to sell. Um, and then also the, the Photoshop thing that came in. So there's a lot of, and I don't hear it so much now, but did for a while that if I see a good image, well, it's all been Photoshopped, hasn't it? And I think that's another element of how the technology has kind of got in the way. Mm. Uh, you know, my experience is if you take something and it, people connect with it and you've done a good job at it, then people will buy it.
actually. I think that is that is what I see anyway. Um, I do think overall it's it's um, as a field it's harder. I mean, certainly for photographers, it's um, you end up diversifying, and a lot of people who do you'll, you'll move into different fields of doing different types of photography. Um, I, I don't think it's an easy place to make money actually. And those staff jobs that I mentioned, I mean, there's fewer staff jobs on magazines, um, you know, and newspapers than there certainly than there used to be. Um, but yeah, this, you can still do it. But I, I would say if you want to make money, the arts is not where you'd start. No, no, <laughs> so no, it's no. about, it's a passion. And if you stick yeah. at it and you work at it and you can build up, then you, you know, you can get there in the end, but there are easier ways to make money for sure. Right. Have you photographed any famous mm -hmm. people? Um, I photographed the Pope once actually. Hey. Did you photograph him in a normal fashion or was it paparazzi like? No, I broke into his house. It was amazing. <laughs> Put the mask on. The Pope, yeah. And I photographed the Dalai Lama, actually. Oh, oh really? So I was in... Um, ah. You're not the first person here who's who's, who's seen the Dalai Lama. No. We don't know. Yeah. We didn't ask to... We need to make it a question we ask oh, every yes. time now. But that, that's Who was it who was here in the other day and they said that they'd, they went to see the Dalai Lama? No, I can't remember. I so. will remember. Yeah, it will come to me. Anyway, there's a story with the yes. necklace as well, right? So I was in... Uh, it kind of dates back to when I started my... Uh, photography career um, I was in Ladakh and it started with a trek actually I was on this I only did a trek with a friend this would be oh, 13 years ago I think and um, I, that's when I got my first small compact digital camera I went up photographing and that just convinced me I wanted to go further and I actually hooked up with a guy running a trekking company and I did his photography for several years and got all my treks for free that was my first kind of contra deal but we're in Ladakh, which is in northwest India, and it's kind of, it's, it's sort of the last stage out towards Jammu and Kashmir and Pakistan. And it's an amazing place to photograph. It's arid and it's, it's a beautiful spot. But the Dalai Lama, I mean, Ladakh is actually probably the um, strongest Buddhist culture in the world, and particularly with what's happened to Tibet being annexed. I mean, Buddhism's been kind of, you know, kind of, um, I don't even know how much it exists there now, probably underground. Um, and the Dalai Lama was on a trip, clearly he's exiled, and he came to Ladakh. And so it wasn't a brilliant photograph. We saw him across the road and I managed to get a picture of him. Uh, you just like seen him like... <laughs> paparazzi, literally. Just walking <laughs> near he is. Yeah. Did you yeah. have the flash on your camera? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't have the flash, yeah. So, so you uh, still got that photo? Mm -hmm. I somewhere, yeah, I've got yeah. a picture of the Dalai Lama, yeah. So I should point out, it wasn't like, it wasn't a commission. I didn't get, you know, uh, right. right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so that was India. So cool. What? Yeah, it's still super cool. What? Mm -hmm. What other countries? Um, well, I guess you've been to a few countries. A few, yeah. One or two. One or two, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Which ones were like? Well, hard to say highlights, but ones that you you did the classic. Put your camera on your back. Uh, yeah. Went on a mission. Um, so I did um, when I started trekking in Ladakh, and then that started for like four or five years. So I did. Uh, Ladakh in India. So Ladakh is India, but then there's other parts of India you can go into. Uh, a, a much less travelled, actually, a place called Nanda Devi, which has got the highest Himalayan peak solely or completely in India. Hmm. Um, and then we did Nepal a few times. Got out to Sikkim, which is in India, but it's between Bhutan and Nepal. Um, I did about four or five years of just going to the. Did about seven or eight trips all through the mountains and just absolutely loved it. And that was the bit that convinced me that I wanted to become, you know, a professional photographer full time. And I started, I ran my first ever workshop in the Himalayas, which was amazing. Oh, and I was, cool. wow. oh, it, it was great. And the, the, how was that? How was the experience? How, oh. how, how did that come about? It was, um, it was a great experience. Actually, the guy who came out was a, he came from Moscow, but he was British. And he, I think he was a diplomat working in Moscow who was into mm -hmm. photography. And he came out and I was so, because it was the first one I'd ever run, I was so concerned about delivering value for money that I ran him ragged for a week and he got ill because we, <laughs> we were up in the morning photographing everything. Um, but it was a great week. A lot, there's a lot of driving. In the, I mean, you end up going over the highest motorable roads, like 18 and a half thousand feet and stuff. It's quite, mm. it's quite mental. And you, you're at altitude anyway, so the altitude's always a, always a problem. Um, so it was great. I absolutely loved it. I think what it convinced me of was it was something I wanted to do, but I didn't want to do it in a country I didn't live in, didn't live in rather, that was so hard to get to. And that's kind of where I ended up the whole thing with the Coromandel because I live here and it's just a lot easier. Uh, but no, it was good, actually. Good. Even yeah. when he got ill, he still seemed to be enjoying himself. So, 
It's, uh, I was just hoping he didn't die. That was the main thing. <laughs> I just needed that reference, you know. <laughs> and did you feel confidence after your first workshop? You were like, okay, that was actually okay. I can do this. Uh, I did. Mm. Yeah, I, I did. I, I'd lucky in my previous, because in between geology and photography, I did something else. And I used to do a lot of client work. So I was, ex I was used to dealing with people, but you can never take it for granted. The con context is everything. So I did actually, yeah, but you're always a bit, nervous before because you never know how it's going to go and you're never sure how people learn and do different things so um i was and it did convince me that i wanted to carry on um and so yeah i guess yeah nice 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 um uh, take us through your current uh <clears throat> vibe of like how what are your favorite things to go and photograph at the moment you, you we, we live in this we were talking about how the coromando is, is so yeah ready for it mm. but like you 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 mentioned the insect and i saw something on your facebook uh the spider the spider thing? yeah yeah that was fantastic so like is it something that it's it's you're going for at the moment getting getting these small things or you just still oh it, it's in there actually i always yeah. like doing <clears throat> macro photography um so that is actually i mean i'm very fortunate you know there's a there's a um, private estate up on the 309 a macro forest estate and I'm very fortunate to be able to to work in there and I do I've done a lot of work for them and they run the kind of predator free um, um Haraki Coromandel organization I've doing amazing work actually and they'd be really good people to get on the show I think okay, cool. um and so because they've been so there's done such an amazing job of conservation there you can go and you can see quite a lot of things that are really difficult to see they're like rare frogs like the arches frogs and the coromandel striped gecko and a whole bunch of other stuff and so i always love going up there and i had a client in a couple of weeks ago who loved forests i said right we'll go and do a night trip so oh, we went cool. up and we just walked basically we get um sarah guides us around it's her place and she knows it real amazing best eyesight of anybody i've ever met in my life she can see like an egg a two millimeter wide egg of a, of a butterfly at 30 yards it's amazing um wow. So it so that is something I'm always captivated by. So that night we went out, we saw that little spider, which I kind of put on the Facebook post because anybody mm -hmm. identify it, and I'll um, I'll give you a free print. So I've had so many replies, I've got to work out which one's right. <laughs> <I'm> gonna, <laughs> I'm going to seriously I'm going to seriously upset somebody because I've got to choose. But anyway, um, the beautiful little spider, actually, an amazing color. Mm -hmm. But no, we saw that night, saw lots of different types of wetters, um, fungus, and it's yeah, funguses, these tiny little tiny. Mm -hmm painted wetter on a fungus which is a really beautiful little thing uh so i think like a checkered wetter got a real close-up yeah. of the face like a kind of mug shot of that um we saw the frogs or the geckos that night as well so i, I never don't enjoy doing that because every time you go you see something new and it's mm -hmm. always nice to take somebody up because they i've never taken anybody who didn't who wasn't captivated in this i did have a lady come a, a couple came and he was really into insects and she wasn't <laughs> and I and I, I took her out. I took I took her up there. She got a bit of a thrill. Then I took her down. There's um there's a, a mine down at Driving Creek, and they've got wetters in there. And I took her in there, and she really did not want to go in, but she got a picture of a wetter really close up, and actually kind of got into it. So so what what kind of lights do you take with you to not disturb as well, but still be able to to see what's happening? Um, so I use a flash <clears throat> at night. So you've got to right. you've got to make sure it's in the right setting. Yeah. Um, but I use like a ring flash, which minimizes the glare and reflections. So. But like when you guys are walking, do you, do you have like a, a light on your helmet or something? Someone carries something like a head torch. Yeah, you need <clears throat> a head torch at night. Yeah. So, right. Would mm. you go for that, Brett? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Because uh, I was going to ask, are they, uh, is all that there because it's predator free? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, you might get it somewhere else. You do get wetters, but you don't get as many. Yeah. And yeah. you don't get the variety and certainly so what, just rats and, and ferrets and stoats and all yeah, that sort of crap? Well, so we don't have, well, we didn't have ferrets, but they reckon we're starting to see ferrets on the Coromandel, which is a bit of a oh, worry right. because the stoat, stoats are bad enough. Um, but stoats, rat possums as well, will eat wetters and spiders and stuff. Mm. But the ferrets are a worry because they've started finding, I think a few have been trapped here. And the worry about the wetters particularly is that they know with the Kiwi, because uh, Project Kiwi out in Kuatunu, um, mm. the Waitaya, um, if you basically rear a chick till about 18 months old, its chance of surviving a stoat attack increases massively from like about 5% to 60%. Um, but ferrets are much bigger than stoats and they could mm. even probably take on an adult kiwi. So it is a worry at the moment that ferrets mm. are being seen to be moving in. But yeah, in short, mm. it's, it's predators that eat them. That's the, that's the problem. Yeah. 
So from from all for all these uh, projects that we we have in the area, uh, you mentioned you just mentioned a couple of them. But like, mm -hmm. which other projects are you aware of, or you're part of, or you know that people are, are doing something good for the environment? Because you talk about the the nat talk about nature with so much passion. You know, we we can yeah. see that you, you, it's really it, it moves you. So what <laughs> projects are are happening around us that we you know yeah. the people from the Caribbean they went from around the world because our audience is pretty broad like yeah. should be aware of the work doing being done here uh oh god number actually top of the head is i i, I think macro particularly for me just because the amazing work they're doing the biodiversity they've 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 allowed to come back um just near where i am brings beach estate my partner shirley works in there they've got kiwi moving in there because they've, they've been trapping that um, for a long time, so that's you know they've got a real uh, increase in the biodiversity. Project mm. Kiwi, as I understand, is probably one of the most successful mm. Kiwi conservation programs in the country. Again, somebody might challenge me, but they're not here. But it is <laughs> whether it is the most or not, it's it's been amazingly successful. Mm. Um, if you go further north, you know you've got on on, on the, the kind of the other side of the Coromandel, um, the Thames side, Coromandel through to Colville, you know, Mohau, Mohau Environment Group doing amazing work. Um, oh, there's Kapawai down near Coraglen, uh, Parangi over the water from Fitianga. There are groups all over kind of building up. And there's up at Tangiaro, if you go past Kennedy Bay, there's a Kiwi area up there as well. Uh, mm. I did a talk there kind of end of last year. Uh, there's quite a few actually. Mm. And, the, and mm. the thing about a lot of the conservation groups, they, um, not all of them, but a number of them, are, they, they, they don't advertise themselves mm. that well and they don't get the visibility. So that's one of the things about working with Predator Free, um, Haraki Coromandel there, trying to help people communicate what they do. Now, some of the groups are all over that and they're really good at marketing. The Rings Beach crowd, Parangi are very good at that. Um, but um, it's the thing about communicating what they do mm. and making it more visible. So more people get involved, more funding comes yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. But there's, there's a lot of projects here. I think it's quite, it's, it's a good spot. When you mentioned the, the Predator Free, I, I'm not super knowledgeable about it, but like, a lot of the predators in New Zealand they were introduced by men. Is that is that is that right to say? Is that, is that correct? Well, all of them. Yeah, all of them. Mm. Yeah. Well, you would have found that birds do prey on insects, or native birds would prey on native insects. But um, they would already have that that natural balance. You'd though. think, yeah, that's I would, right. I would, I would I would hope. Yeah, you're right. Mm. So the thing about the predators, the the ones that've been brought in, they're just m much more um, efficient, effective. Uh, they, you know evolved in much more competitive you know there were no mammals here apart from bats you know mammals are we are you know part of that mm. competitive aggressive species so it's the introduced ones that have really upset the balance oh uh, not necessarily uh, though like like introduced as in purposefully though no, some of them, right, some of them no, have no, been yeah, yeah. some of them have like you know jumped ship yeah right yeah, yeah, rats yeah, 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 that's right yeah, yeah. yeah. so Sorry, just clarifying the introduced part <laughs> yeah. like, oh welcome but yeah, some yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. apparently there is a i was reading uh, rereading my new zealand history last year and apparently the stoat was actually there was a debate in parliament at the time because somebody oh usual somebody brought rabbits in and thought oh, we'll bring rabbits in and they'll do something or other and then they mm. went and did the, something else and that just that's all the grass and then somebody thought oh, we'll bring stoats in they'll kill all the rabbits. And there was a debate in parliament, apparently, and somebody they were saying, this is a really bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> um, and this guy, the guy did it anyway. So of course the stoats come in and go, oh, yeah, the rabbits run around, but these birds don't do much. So I think I'll eat those first, you know? And it was this oh, litany yeah, of yeah, yeah. errors. And some of it was, <clears throat> some of it was deliberate. Like, you know, possums, failed fur industry. Look where we are now, yeah. there's millions yeah, of the things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they're extinct in a lot of places. Like I think in Australia, they, they, they don't even, Thrive, oh, endangered at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, the, the other thing it's worth mentioning also. I think it's is a it, different possum now. Yeah, mm. it is. It, well, the, I thought I, I'm not sure. I thought they were from the same stock, but I was just well. I think I was a fatter because they just. Oh, maybe they, maybe they are. Yeah, <laughs> they, they look great. different from what I was saying, but I could be yeah, totally wrong. They do. Yeah. Um, mm. But the other thing is habitat loss as well. So that is one thing that as we, you know, we take more land for development and we. You know, we do spray things on the land and other stuff. The, the loss of habitat, particularly things like mm. wetland areas, mm. becomes more of a problem. Um, I also know a shout out to Anna Meek um, from um, Kiwatuna, who looks runs the bird protection, does an amazing job looking after birds. 
you know, she's saying in some years, the, the, you know, the warming of the oceans, we believe, is affecting food supplies. And so mm. it's it's man's activity, sometimes direct, sometimes environmental. Um, but I, I suppose overall my feeling about that is generally, you know, we have an amazing ecosystem here. Animals, mm. I mean, some birds, like the wattle birds, have never existed anywhere else in the world. We have some birds like mm. the Takahe is a rail. There are rails around the world. It's kind of unique here and it is unique here. <laughs> But some animals have never existed in any other country. And you think, I always, you know, without getting too heavy about it, I think it's a measure of our humanity. If we have a choice about not letting them go extinct, if it's simply down to can we be bothered or not, mm. um, it seems to me letting these things become extinct because of the uniqueness is just <clears throat> tragic, really. And I get really inspired by some of the individuals I meet and the work they put in, the commitment and the results. So whenever I see something really special, like that little spider, I think, you know, it's something, mm. you know, it's, yeah, I don't know, a bit odd, but, I, I, well, I, I, is it a bit odd? I think there's a lot of no, people feel the same, yeah. actually, yeah. 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 It's funny you say that about, like, just can't be bothered, though, eh? Yeah. It's literally that, like, the, all the all these efforts that go on quite often are private efforts, aren't they? Mm. Or, you know, the publicly f funded efforts and things like that, and it's like, yeah, we get the government involved and it's just like, okay, we'll just drop 1080 on it. <laughs> It'll hopefully deal with the problem, you know, mm. and it's just like, or they're, they're leaving it up to people. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you got to really give it to them. They put, they do they it, put yeah. the hours in, don't they? Especially like, the, you know, out, out Waitai with the Kiwis and stuff yeah, like it's that. Amazing, man. They yeah. put in massive amounts of effort. I know I'd been down to Wellington a few times and I've, They've got those places that are like fenced off, you know, like the predator free. The Zealandia, that's yeah. right, yeah. And I was, when you were saying that, I was wondering if there was something we could do with that. Because, like, being on a peninsula, You'd think, we could yeah. hopefully be able to fence it, you know, yeah. like that would be quite a quite an ideal place where you could have a whole peninsula that is, yeah. you know, predator free. That would be a good goal. It would be. I mean, I think the mm. fences, I remember we were lived in Wellington and gone back a while actually when they were building that fence. And I remember at the time thinking this would never work and it's been a spectacular success. Mm. And they've got some others. The ones, I mean, there's a few. There's one down in um, Otago Peninsula. They've got one up oh, yeah. Sanctuary Mountain, which is uh, Monga Tortory, which is on down towards Cambridge, where they put a really big oh, yeah. one around oh, the top of the mountain. Okay. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And that's been amazing. But they're, they're expensive to build and obviously you, you need to maintain them. Yeah, but it's a good point about the peninsula. I, I do know there's there's been conversations around whether that something like that could be done out towards the Apito Peninsula. Oh, yeah. um, but it's a good point. You'd think a peninsula is ideal to put something like that in. Because you could even get away with not <clears throat> even necessarily a fence, but you could make a perimeter of of intensive trapping. Yeah, which is what people do. And, uh, is yeah. that they do that? I, I, <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's kind of, no, no, but it's true. That's kind yeah. of how the work at Mahakaro works in Rings Beach. They don't have a fence, but they intensively trap. But it's a lot of work and effort. Mm. Um, mm. Um, and so it, it is, it, it's hard. I mean, you know, if you leave these, some people do say we should just leave nature to sort itself out. I think, well, actually nature didn't bring all these things over yeah. here. We did. Yeah. Your nature's not destroying you. hundred percent. Yeah, we You do. can't introduce something like that and then just go, it's going to sort itself out. Because, yeah. well, they're dead right. It will sort itself out. Yeah, and we just but, beat rats uh, but, and cockroaches. But, but, but yeah. yeah, but we will be, we'll be left with a whole lot of extinct animals. That's right. And we'll <laughs> you know? die. Yeah. And we'll, we will be at risk as well at some stage, you know, like like we talk about the bees a lot, yeah, right? right? You know, like this thing with letting go, oh, no, it's all right. Well, they produce a lot of the things that are essential for our lives, right? So I watched this one on YouTube about bees. Yeah. Have you seen it? It's, I, I, must, I don't know if it's new or not, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's really interesting. <clears throat> and it was talking about, it's the wild bees that are like the most at risk because a lot of bees have evolved over the, over the large amounts of time to be specific pollinators for certain types of plants. Mm -hmm. And we're, keeping honeybees and protecting honeybees, which are sort of like generic pop pollinators. Mm -hmm. They pollinate sort of everything, but not so greatly. But we are tending to do it because we get a product from it, which is really, really valuable, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, oh, it was interesting because you sort of had to look at it from two different lenses, like of like, one of them's like, is this just propaganda, <laughs> propaganda <laughs> yeah. again, you know? But, or, or is it like, <clears throat> oh, okay we need to worry about the wild bees, you know? And yeah. I mean, I'm not sure about that so much in New Zealand, for example, but I know overseas, like where they have the places that naturally grow um, 
the plants that like they've grown there forever and that's where they came from and they have the wild bees there to to do the pollination you know mm -hmm. as opposed to like the moving of bees around from like the almonds to the to the apples to the um you know whatever the all the plants are the monocrop you know and they move them around and i thought that was really it was really out of it i still don't find it, it was really interesting mm, yes yes please mm. well we humans interfere on the process and then yeah. it's hard to support the conservation um work that people do because where's the profit you know like yeah. no one is making anything out of mm. this like the argument that is they're keeping us alive it, it doesn't work mm. you know like for, for a lot of people it, it doesn't make sense well it's not a, it's not a short-term thing is it the, the money is short term but the the consequence can be longer term but not necessarily any less real and i think That's it's right. easy we get drawn into this debate of is it making money now um but there's you know there's more you know there's a lot more value to things than just the cash i can put on it you know oh, man. if i dig it up if i burn it if i chop it down i can make some cash now and you think well there's more there is more mm. to life. I do think a lot more people are thinking that way um, mm. as well. Um, but I do think that the challenge with conservation is you can fight to protect something for 30 years and you lose the fight once and it's gone. So it is, mm. you know, I, the, the vigilance and the work that people put in to protect this place is quite something actually, you know. And it's upsetting because you said people are becoming more aware, but it's because it's getting harder to put up with a lot of you know things that nature now is, is giving back to us so yeah. people start like, oh when it when it becomes something that affects us and then we're like oh we gotta do something about yeah, it yeah, so yeah, yeah. unfortunately we, we don't know what's going to be right is it going to be the water is it going to be the air first yeah. that is going to comp be compromised and then we're going to have to do something as humanity yes because like our survival in, yeah, yeah our quality of our life becomes a problem we need to be proactive is i i think the thing there was one thing that on a chat on an earlier podcast you had where it was like with the rivers and stuff and it's like well we fix them when we evaluate the river and then fix it like come up with the solution for the problem of the mm -hmm. of the deterioration of the river and it's like that's cool and that's cool as an initial assessment that's fine because that's an initial assessment but like you need to be proactive and to stop it from happening not waiting mm -hmm. until it's too bad to then try and repair it you know yeah as opposed, like, same to do with the, with the pests and, you know, yeah, yeah. protecting the kiwis, you've got to be proactive because once it's too late, it's too late, you know? Yeah, once it's gone. Because, yeah, no, are you fixing the symptom or are you fixing the root cause? That's the other thing as well, you mm. know? Are you just cleaning up something in front of you or thinking, actually, why is why did this get like this in the first place? Mm. Yeah. Okay, I was just checking my phone because we have some questions from the audience, which is pretty cool, our live chat. It's always active, okay. which is a good thing. I'm nervous People now. People are watching our show. Yeah, yeah, man, I didn't tell you about that, eh? did yeah. I? Ooh. Any about the haircut? I don't know. We'll get there. <laughs> we'll get you there. never said what specific camera you have. A Canon oh, wait, wait, wait. I think there's a question about I'm that. I'm sure so there will be a question. Right, yeah. Everyone's waiting. Just before we do that, we have a sponsor for the show tonight, which is pretty cool. Really? Is pretty good. Yeah, we do, we do, we do. Nice. We do. And uh, it's our, well, Illus Tyler. It's a fantastic illustrator, animator, designer, and he works for professional creative storytelling. He does amazing stuff. He did our logo, by the way, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Good man. Um, so if you guys like or need that kind of service, if you if you are into like storyboards, if it's something a bit more professional or just design for logos or <laughs> for your business, have a look at his website. I'm just gonna read it. It's Illus Tyler. Can you, oh, we put the logo, eh? Oh yeah, it's just here next to me. That's cool, if you're watching, and if you're not watching, if you're listening, you go to illustyler.com, which is I-L-L-U-S-T-Y-L-E-R.com. Illustyler, Great, right? Illustyler. Illustyler, Illus Illus yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good play on words. Yes, I know, mm. right? Creative, creative guy. Have a look at his website, and yeah, thanks. His name is Tyler Downey, fantastic guy. And, uh, we have questions, as I said. And blah, 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 blah. <laughs> people saying good morning from Germany, which is fantastic. Good morning. Good morning. Good wow. morning. Guten Tag. So there you go. That was the question, right? <laughs> Ian, I don't know. Yeah. Canon or Nikon? And what are your opinions of the new breeds of high-end mirrorless cameras that are becoming very popular at the moment? Also, nice to see a fellow Brit on the show. Oh, cool. There you go. Excellent. Um, so I think you mentioned earlier Canon, but that was because I got advice 
at the start from a bird photographer. This is 13, 14 years ago. I think once you've, and you know, once you bought the camera, the thing that you invest in then is the lenses. And so I upgraded from a crop sensor to a full frame, which is the kind of, and a full frame basically means the sensor, uh, which is ultimately the thing that determines the quality of the image. You know, there's other things like the process and stuff, but the, the physical size of the sensor, which is the thing that captures the light. So when I say full frame, it means that the sensor is the same size as a 35 mil um, negative, um, you know, mm. from a camera. Oh, okay. So yeah. when you look at a crop sensor or a phone, the sensor in the phone is is pretty small compared mm -hmm. to a full frame. So uh, I upgraded to full frame, and once I started buying lenses, you don't go back because it's the you know, if you buy enough, eventually 80 percent of your cost is in the lenses. So you upgrade the body. Um, I think starting again. Uh, would it Nick Cannon, Nick on? I don't think it would matter. Actually, I have a lot of clients coming with Nick on. I have a lot of clients with all sorts of cameras, Sony, Lumix, uh, Fujifilm. Um, I do like, there are some things that Nick on have that I really like. Um, if you're doing, if you're using the monitor on the back of the camera to do compositional work for landscape on a tripod, you can zoom in further, um, certainly than my camera. Um, you can zoom in further on the Nick on and get a more detailed view, which is great for manual focusing. So. That's a feature I've seen, uh, but yeah, I would. I just I'm invested in in Canon now, so yeah. So what's do you use more than one camera? I've got several. Yeah, I mean I'm I'm guessing you probably, but do you have one main one? I do. Yeah. So my main camera, just to know, is it's the Canon 5D Mark IV, which is non mirrorless. Though I have just bought recently um, one of the Canon mirrorless cameras, the RP, which is their kind of entry level. Mm -hmm. um it's quite i kind of got arranged the deal through canon which is really good of them actually and it's um so the question the guy was asking about mirrorless um, mm -hmm. for me mirrorless in itself other than um it, it there's less vibration when you're basically there's no mirror to move out of the way looking through the lens the mirrorless itself bit doesn't add to me to the quality of the picture but what you do find with newer cameras they're always putting new features in um and trying to improve the image quality so one of the the big things about the newer breed of cameras, they're constantly trying to improve how good the image is in low light. So the grain mm. thing we talked about. So newer cameras will often tend to be an improvement on that. Um, I think the um, the kind of top end Canon mirrorless camera, I think it's the five, I always get the five and the six the wrong way around. I think it's the five. I think it's technically an uplift on the one I've got. I'm not sure the six is. So at some point I might make the move. Um, the one I bought recently, the entry level uh, mirrorless I really like it's got one of those um, monitors you can pop out and spin it around so if you're doing shots mm. just hand oh. and you're looking for some angles and stuff it's really neat the thing that is I do really like about it and this is for the photographers is when you look through the viewfinder um, rather than on the back of the camera in the in the viewfinder it's got um, you can see quite a lot of information about things like your exposure I think all the histogram mm. so if anyone's listening to photography histogram really essential thing to 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 know really simple to know but you can see it all through the viewfinder mm. so that's a really nice thing that it's easier to um kind of work with your settings and and you know change so usually settings. you can't not no you can't not through you, you get a meter which gives you an approximate mm. value yeah what the histogram tells you basically foolproof is is my shot going to be over or underexposed mm. and is it, that the bar it's is it a, a bar of different gradients? It is. So what it is looks it like, like is it looks like a bit of a graph that's different mm -hmm. for everything that you look at. Oh, yeah. And yeah. what it's telling you is what light's hitting the sensor. And if it's too far one way or the other, it's either over or underexposed. Oh, so yeah. you change your settings, get it in the middle, effectively, simply, and then that that's foolproof. So if you can see that through the viewfinder while you're adjusting your settings, it's really powerful. Because why do you use the viewfinder over using just the back of the camera? Um, it depends what you're... Because I see a lot of people using the viewfinder and I'm like, man, it looks so much easier just to like look at the yes. screen, you know? Um, but I'm... Yeah, a couple of reasons. When it's really bright, the glare off the LCD monitor, the monitor at the back, it's an LCD screen. Mm. You don't see it as easily. Um, so one uh... reason is you can see better through the viewfinder. The other one is if you're doing... So if I'm doing landscape stuff on a tripod, always use the, I always use the monitor if it's not too bright. But if I'm doing um, anything like... Oh, I don't know if I'm doing like bird photography or people photography. Mm -hmm. If I want to be precise around my focal point, and particularly if I'm moving around, it's just easier through the viewfinder because you oh, can yeah. choose your focus point and, and nail it. Mm -hmm. um, you can use you can use the screen actually, um, 
But yeah, for some types, it's just easier using the viewfinder. Oh, I know it's, it's, a lot of people do use it, so I was figured there must be a reason yeah, yeah. why, you know. Yeah. You asked me that, I was going thinking, oh, is it a good reason? But yeah, there is. I've got <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it is a good reason. <laughs> There's a question here um, that we kind of touched on the subject before, but I like the end of the question, so I'll read it. Thanks, Chloe. Uh, what are your opinions on having apps so accessible to edit your selfies for things for like Instagram, etc., for young people's self esteem? Ooh, I think, well, there's clearly a problem. I mean, the apps themselves, um, I think having access to apps to edit images in principle is a good thing. Uh, but it's like everything, isn't it? We, how we use them is always the problem. We create technology and we think it's neutral and then people use it for all sorts of reasons. I think, to the question about self-esteem, I think there clearly is a problem with self-esteem and Instagram itself has said that. Um, I mean, Facebook has said it, as, you know, they try to bury it. I think it is a problem. And if you're using, I guess, the inference of the question is if you're using those apps to make yourself look more presentable or acceptable to a peer group, um, it, it doesn't, if that's what it's about, it doesn't sound great. But then these things are always complicated. You know, if you want to get a you know, a photograph done a professional portrait, you're going to try and get someone who's going to make you look as good as they can. Mm -hmm. You're going to edit the picture and... Weird makeup. Yeah, yeah. Well, Have yeah. a fresh shave. Yeah. Do you hear? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. So um, I, don't, I think it's, you know, there's never a simple answer, but I think it is, there is a problem with that thing of mm -hmm. trying to be somebody you're not and feeling that pressure of if, 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 if the, you know, that you have young persons in that, in that, that kind of zone of, you know, feeling the pressure to be accepted physically, mm. it's not a good place to be. Um, so I don't know. But in some cases, I think people, it's all about how you use it, I think. How you use it. Yeah, yeah definitely. But I don't think it's just young people either. <laughs> no. No, it's no. not, eh? No. Okay, we got a young cool one Young people don't here. need the filter. We got a cool one here from Dane. <laughs> Neither do old people. <laughs> Dane asks, out of all your photos, which one is your favorite? And why? That's oh, a man, that's a killer. Woo. I can answer that today. What would my favorite shot be? I like that answer. I can answer that today. It's your right favorite now. picture of is it the right Is it now. the blurry photo of the Dalai Lama? It was my thumb, actually. It was my thumb. Did I'm you like? Oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, While you think about that, yeah, just to make you think about all the photos you've done oh, over your lifetime, yeah, is there a is do you publish anywhere where, you, where someone could look through? Like, I mean, I was just looking at your business card. You got your website here, yeah, yeah, um, and your Instagram, which is obviously a good place for photo yeah. sharing. Um, but do you have a place that has, for lack of a better word, like bulk, like a, like lots of your photos? Yeah, have you got on your on your Facebook, yes, yeah, on or the, your Instagram or Facebook. So website, website, I've got a little. I've got my port. What I call it portfolio. So that's got. Um, it's not all my kind of India work, Himalayan work and stuff, but it's actually mm -hmm. got all, all, a selection of the shots I've taken here in the, in the Coromandel, New Zealand. So yeah, on my website, I've got, and people can buy through the website as well. Prints and stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I well, thought look, if you're thinking about your website, it might make you think of your favourite picture you've taken. You it know? is. I was actually th <laughs> thinking all on that card. I think at the moment, just because I, I, um, I went and got it from the print shop yesterday. There was a shot I did, um, which wasn't actually in the field. It's Who the, printed that? Uh, it's a company called PCL. Oh, Auckland. did you hear that, Ange? Yeah, no. shout, shout <laughs> out. <laughs> Top end printers. They're, no. ve they're very good, actually. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, and it's actually that image we got on the card. It was the shells, shells, the angel wings. Mm -hmm. So story behind that, it's, um, that's the one. Um, that um, is a friend of mine who collects shells. Claire Elliott lives in Atama. And that was um, a macro shot, focus stacks, so about 70 shots. Hmm. So having said I don't do Photoshop much and I do it all in the field, that wasn't. But I was just really, really pleased with the results. And um, the reason I'm thinking about it now is I went to PCL, so I had it printed up on a, a large print, and they use this amazing um, paper, which is actually true. F uh, even though it's digital, I've got obviously digital images, and normally you use what's called the Jicle ink inkjet process. They use true C-type photographic paper, which is light mm. sensitive. So the blacks around the shells are really kind of deep black, and it's actually um, effectively a photographic plastic. It's a Fuji product, mm. and it just the image just is amazing. So I'm thinking of that one because I just picked it up yesterday from Auckland. So yeah, cool. If you need a model to put them on, I, you could superimpose 
these on on my back if you want. I could. I, I could. <laughs> I'll be the angel. I could. <laughs> The fallen angel. I'm getting, lo I'm getting lots of. I'm getting <laughs> up in the back seats back there. See, I thought you were coming here for a chat. Oh, Suddenly, man, you're got, giving, I'm giving you ideas, I'm man. So much to think about. <laughs> is this two? Is this two shelves? It is two shelves. It yeah. is. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so that was done in a. I did a whole series of them actually. Of like it's these very impressive. They're very, it is awesome. very <clears throat> symmetrical. Yes. So, mm. well, uh, there's another aspect of you know nature when you look at the detail of it is the amazing structures and patterns you see in flowers, mm. insect shells. And we have had no hand in creating any of that. And this amazing, and, and, and the thing I like about macro particularly, um, and the real close-up stuff like that spider, is I mm. couldn't see the detail on the spider, but I can through the lens. And it's stunning. And you see particularly, wet has amazed me because they've got patterns on their legs and they're almost like tattoos. Mm. And they vary between insects. And again, it's this amazing design that we've had no part in whatsoever. Mm. It just makes, I look mm. at it. I don't, it's not like a mystical thing. I don't look at that and think, well, there must be some divine entity therefore who created it. I just look mm. at it and go, there's something going on there that I don't get. It's, mm. it's kind of above me. And it, yeah, it like makes a, a tattoo, a wetter tattoo parlor is all I can think of. Yeah, there is that. Yeah. It's bananas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it just, mm. it just gives me a sense of kind of perspective, I yeah, suppose, yeah, you know, yeah. and you know, and I was, I know Alastair was in here um, recently talking about when you see the stars and your position in the universe. And I feel the same when I see the Milky Way, but I feel the same when I look at something so intricately detailed and beautifully designed. And it just, mm. you think, God, oh, we, mm. Maybe we're just a bit arrogant sometimes about our place in the world, you know? Well, because it's always about the human perspective, yeah. right? We forget that every little single life out there or big one has their own perce perception and perspective of, of what's happening yeah. around us, right? So, yeah. no, you're right, you're right. And not knowing things can be so good, right? Can be so, can, can fuel creativity mm. and all those things because <clears throat> not, not criticizing religion or anything, but like, when you when you rely on something that someone tells you yeah. that gives you all the answers, it might stops you from from seeing yeah. a lot of things that you don't understand. And by not understanding, that's the thing with creativity that sometimes you say, "Oh, I, I'm not," but like, I don't think that you are not. Maybe you just haven't tapped yeah, the right. way that it will find you. You know, you won't have to find it. It will find I you. I don't think it's been invented yet. <laughs> it's coming, man. Give it time. Give it time. You never know. You you know. Do you, you cook? Know, Actually, that question. You are you a, do you cook? Oh, it? I used to. Yeah, you go. That's, cre that's, that's serious. That's creative. No, I used to love cooking, but then when I, I quit drinking, and when I quit drinking, I stopped cooking. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I used to enjoy just like having a beer and prepping everything, yeah. and then like you know the spices <laughs> and frying onions, yeah. and and I was really like that. And then when I didn't have <laughs> better drink with it. I was like, oh, oh that's well. the paradox. That's the, the par you have to suffer for your art. So yeah, yeah. right. I just want to read one more comment <laughs> here before we, we keep it with the chat. Uh, although Photoshop or Lightroom really are art forms of their own, uh, there's an honesty to getting a beautiful picture in camera. 100%. 100%. And yeah. I wouldn't say manipulation in Photoshop is wrong. I wouldn't be that arrogant, but I completely agree. Yeah. Um, would you go back to England? Would you live there again? Uh, I'm going back for a visit and going back in July for two months. It's been three years. I've got a couple of brothers there and really close to. So, um, yeah, I will for a visit. Would I live there again? Um, no, I don't think so. I think we never say never, who knows? Yeah, but yeah. I, um, I just lose the connection with the things I've got here. You know, we've got where we live. I and mean, I talked a lot about conservation, where we live in Kuatuna, we've got about f nearly 50 acres and we, we turned that into a conservation block. So we planted a lot of trees out there, cool. uh, a lot of help from cool. environment Waikato actually. Nice. So, but that was a real kind of dream we had that became a reality. And I'd find it, yeah, it'd be hard to turn our backs on that. And actually where we are, the community, Houston is an amazing community. It's just so many people so passionate about the things they do and the reasons they're there. So, um, yeah, we could, but it's hard, you know, it's like anyone who's mm. traveled, you guys have come in, it's, you got family, you got friends everywhere. It's difficult, but you yeah, at some yeah. point, we did actually try the traveling between the countries for a while. And somebody said to me, oh yeah, that must be the best of both worlds. And in the end it's the, it's neither. Cause you, in the end you think, well, where do I belong? And that's what I found in the end is actually, I can't keep flitting. I've got to decide where mm. to be. And yeah. How, how, how was that for you? How was that thing of like, you know, changing your, your culture and, and absorbing something new and like, do you. When, because that's that's something that that happens to me 
it's been happening lately, you know, like grandparents aging and then you see your parents mm -hmm. also, you know, like everything is changing and then you try to relate to your country and things are so different, mm -hmm. you know, and then you're like, wow, I don't even know what's going on there anymore. And yeah. then here, sometimes like we live here, so we love here, but still, you know, sometimes the, the, the cultural background doesn't yeah. match. And then you're like, oh, I'm not even, I don't even know what these people are talking about, yeah. you know, yeah. like, are you, are you comfortable? Are you, are you cool with, with the way that your journey um, has been? It's a good question, actually. Um, I think it's like anywhere. I don't know where's perfect, is it? And the thing you often, you go to a place for the first time, you think, oh, it'd be cool to live here. Mm. Then you live there, you think, oh, there's, there's all sorts of things I don't like about it. Um, I think it's not, you know, there are things about, you know, everywhere you live, there's always challenges. I mean, half the time, the challenge is yourself and how you choose to live. You know, I was saying before about work of just constantly doing too many things. Is it, It's me, you know, it's the place doesn't create that. And I'd probably be doing that until the day I keel over. So um, it's not about the, you know, perfection. I think the, I do, I love the parts of the UK. I love, I suppose I struggle with some of the things I see happening there. And certainly at the moment, some of the things that were going on. Um, biggest factor, there's so many people there. I mean, we lived in Scotland for a while, which I absolutely loved. But the thing about Scotland was um, the weather isn't great. It's a fantastic, it's an ancient country. I was saying earlier, I don't know if I said it on camera, but you can go and touch rocks up near um, 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 Sky, which were the three and a half billion year old rocks. And you can put your hands on them. And it's amazing because where they've broken, they're really shiny. You think, how could something, it's like, oh, I don't know, I know, I get it, but it's how can something three and a half billion now, mm. years old still be like, sh you know, shiny. So I miss that. You go to the Orkneys and you've got, you know, the, the you know, the Scandinavians were traveling through there 6,000 years ago, forming a civilization. Th this stuff is incredible, but I, I don't, we have a sense of freedom here, actually, that mm. we feel and sense of space. And I, it's just something about the place really. Um, and we have great beaches, man, and we have a sea you can swim in. I mean, Scotland's fantastic, but I wouldn't go in the sea. So there'd be lots of people listening going, oh, I hate you. Yeah. <laughs> and all, all our, our Scottish friends considering coming to New Zealand now, now is no, the time. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> but I do, when we go back, I'm catching up with friends in Scotland. It's, it's an amazing country. I loved the sense of space. You see a lot of walking, a lot of photography there. You go out to the islands and you've got these incredible communities that just go back and in really hard communities. I mean, they went through a lot of, you know, difficult country to live in. They went through the land clearances, you know, we've got that, that whole colonial dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. every, every, everywhere around the world. And I think I, I yeah, it's a fabulous country, uh, fabulous. And I love parts of England. We're going to go and visit. I don't want to make it sound like I'm a hater cause I'm not, mm. um, you just some, at some point you, I find it's how you are. I couldn't be jumping between places. It just, yeah, it wasn't connecting. Do you like Banksy work? I do, I do, yeah, yeah. I think it's nice that he's um, he's irreverent, which mm -hmm. is good, spontaneous, mm -hmm. and I like the fact that he um, he kind of buries his identity as well. Yep. So yeah, I do actually. And it's cool how his pictures become most of the time the piece of art because yeah. people just erase the the, the artwork, right? Yeah. He goes, he makes something on the wall, like tags or something, and then it's gone. Yeah. But someone gets the picture. It photographs it, and that's then right. Suddenly yeah. it's the photography that is that is the piece of art. Yeah. Are there other artists that are relevant to you? Like they that you follow at the moment or just like in, in, in history, like favorites favorite artists, favorite photo photo oh. photographers or so uh, photographers, um Bresson, I think, because there is a lot of his black and white. I'm not a great studier of photography, I should so I'm not, um, yeah, it's just, <laughs> we'll get that out of the way now. But, but I remember um, Bresson, I thought his, his, you know, his use of film and his composition and his simplicity, his composition was amazing. I think um, Ansel Adams, I think just, you know, he pioneered that, you know, the kind of the F64 really narrow aperture and the whole idea of having your camera mounted on top of your car. Um, but I did think the images he took were quite amazing. And I've been in the States to a few of the places where he photographed. There is actually a thing where people will go to all the places he went and take the pictures that he took, which is, um, I found a slightly odd motivation when you think, well, I'll go and do my own thing. I don't know, you know, but it was. It's like a pilgrimage almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, a little bit. I was just going to try and get a picture so it wasn't as good as his. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> I'm sure I can save up the money for another air flight somewhere. Um, so there are a few, I think painters I'm connected to, mm. I think the landscape painters, some of the 
forget the name, but some of the Dutch landscape painters were amazing where they'd paint the, oh, can I forget his name now? There was an exhibition in London a few years ago and they just paint, it's in the North Sea, so they weren't spectacular landscapes. It's flat, basically, it's Holland. So you had a bit of land, but like 80% sky and they just, the way they captured the skies and the look and the feel, um, I used to love stuff like that. Um, I was a big fan of Turner as well, because he started out as a, um, he was an architect, basically, you know, a technical drawer, technical um, mm. artist, but he moved into his impressionistic work as well. And that bit around where he used to, you know, he used to tie himself to the mast and be in the middle of a storm and some of the work that he captured. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, a few, but I'm not, I, I don't know. I, I, this, it's not meant to sound arrogant. I guess I mm. get most of my inspiration from being outdoors yeah, yeah, and yeah. seeing no, it's not things I see. So, yeah. And people can judge whether they think I'm successful or not in what I do. So, yeah. Have you ever got into uh, movies, film? I've done a, not really, no. I've done a little bit of video interviewing as part of oh, storytelling okay. that I did over the last year that was, um, I was pleased, but then I had very low expectation. So it's not <laughs> something I do, no. Um, it's not, I think it was good actually to add, a, it was overlaying a, a story on top of some um, imagery of, a, of an area. So, and it was nice to get it. And I, it's something I'd like to play with more, but it, yeah, got a massive learning curve, not something I've, I've tried yet. What about Net Geo or New Zealand Geographic? Anything in, in, in them? No, I've never sent anything in, actually. Ah. It's, it's on my list. I should think about it. That'd be cool. Yeah, I Next should. time you come on, I want to hear that you were in the latest ne National Geographic yeah. for, you know, tattooed, tattooed um, wetters and stuff. Wetters. <laughs> yeah, I've got some some shots of the of the arches and some of the um, of the geckos. I've got some shots which I think, yeah, I reckon be worth a shot. So, yeah, I just haven't tried it. Yeah, so... Anything else you would like to, to ask before we, we wrap it up, sir? Um, no, I actually did have something, and then when you asked me, I forgot it, so I'll have to find out afterwards when I remember yeah. again. Damn. <laughs> so let's just go through the, uh, the information about the exhibition yeah. that I'm looking forward to, to, to visiting. So yeah. it's the Driving Creek uh, Gallery? Driving Creek Gallery. So it's the Driving Creek Railway. People will know it as. It's just north of Coromandel Town. It's a really cool spot. And they've got the pottery. And they've got actually got the railway. It's very good. And they've got the the zip line as well, which people yeah, can have a go yeah, at. Cool. Uh, but the gallery is really good. I've, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a fabulous gallery they've built. So one of the things that's really, really good about exhibits in there is just the light uh, in there. Not just they've, they've kind of rigged it up professionally, but also the, the light that comes, the way they've set the windows up, there's some great diffuse light in there. Um, so yeah, we start, opening is the Friday, the evening of the 3rd, the official opening, public opening is the 4th of June, Saturday. Are you, are you guys going to be there on the 4th? Yeah, yeah, we will. So we'll cool. be curating it all and managing it all the way through. Oh, cool. So 4th to the 26th of June, uh, weekends and holidays. So we've got the Queen's birthday, the Monday, I think the Matariki is the Friday, 24th i think mm -hmm. so that's 10 till 5 and then uh weekdays it'll be 12 till 4. Mm. so yeah fantastic but come down yeah come oh down. you oh yeah we will and if people want to find out more information about your work or get in touch websites or social media what's the easiest way um i've got our uh, facebook instagram website so all three actually and i get communications through all three so but if you know to brett's question earlier if you want to look at my work websites where i put most of it so i've got a kind of display of my work i've got quite a lot that i've not put up so with this exhibition coming i've got to get it get to get my page updated as well so ian photography.com that's me say it again ian photography.com and his facebook is ian priest photography and there's obviously one person who beat you to Ian Priest at Instagram, so you're Ian Priest one <laughs> at am. Instagram. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, the bastard. <laughs> there's always one, eh? Yes, yes, yes. I don't yes. know what he does. He might be a snooker player. There is an Ian Priest <laughs> snooker player. Oh, never, yeah. You know what? I've never even looked who it was. I shouldn't. That's, that's, that's something else I've learned. I'll have, I'll have a look. Yeah. <laughs> I never said that before, but one of the reasons why we chose Altbase is because it was available in all the platforms. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, we had a list and we really, we really liked well, Altbase. Well, he can't pick his name. Well, I know, right? could, but... Yeah. Just change. <laughs> but we, we did check that. We liked mm -hmm. it and we were like, let's have a look, see if we're not going to have to... I could change my name to Altbase 1. Ah, oh, okay. there yeah, you yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> that might work. I could do it. <laughs> Ian, thank you so much, man. That was cool. No, oh, fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I, we only arranged this kind of late on, but thanks for the opportunity. Last it's been minute. good. Yeah, yeah we it's been made good. it happen. Yeah, no, cool. No, I lo love what you guys are doing. It's really good the people you've had in the kind of shedding, shining a light on a lot of different people in the community. And it's, yeah, it's cool, actually. Really good. 
Thank you. Yeah. Uh, feel free to to recommend some people for us. You know, yeah. like you you've been here for a while, and uh, we, we're going to keep in touch about the the conservation yes project because surely you know more people than I do. So yeah. we would love to bring these people to to spread the I word and talk about. Yeah, I got a few people I think might be worth chatting to. So happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool. Mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to coming to the exhibition. It's going to be great. We should go together. Eh? Mm-hmm. That would be cool. I, w- I really want to go. Yeah, yeah. You got to come and diss my Milky Way show. Oh, well, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to wait till the day where you're there too doing the curating part and I'll just be like, what is that? What is that? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a discarded piece of art that you've taken back. <laughs> the, well prodigal, the prodigal son that's well, returned. I'd be like, well mm-hmm. spotted that man. Yeah. That sounds amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Brad. Thanks. That yeah. was cool, man. It's a pleasure meeting you. Yeah, I ho- cool. I Thank hope you. your, your back feels better soon. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm sure it will be. Ibuprofen will sort it out. Cool. We'll bring a chiropractor to or the show. Maybe they will, they will give you a discount. So let's see. Yeah, wow, well, yeah, chiropractor shout out. Yep. We'll yeah. give it a try. Live <laughs> chiropractic. Hey, mm. and for you watching, thank you so much. Thanks for going on the live chat, asking questions, interacting, uh, sharing the videos. That's really important. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That's a good way to support the platform. That's how we grow. That's how we reach more people. And by reaching more people, we bring more interesting people to the show. We're going to make the Coromando a place where the artists don't miss because it happens quite often, especially with artists and, and musicians. They tour around the country and sometimes they miss the Coromando and we want to make that not happen. We want to bring more people to our area and I don't know, do some work with, with uh, the youth as well. So thank you so much. We're live every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at 7 p.m. Also, you should have a look at the alt base clips where we get the highlights and we break down the interview so you can watch the clips and choose your favorite ones to listen to the whole show we are on spotify apple podcasts google podcasts all of them all the main audio platforms this chat will be there tomorrow if you are listening right now thank you so much we're back on friday with kathy clowns from mm-hmm. all about it younger it's going to be a great chat and then on monday show number 50 special one I'll see you guys there. Thanks, Papa. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. Welcome. Ciao. Ciao.